Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Council meeting for the 20th of March 2024. Can I welcome councillors, staff, members of the public? Great to see the chambers full as it is today. Uh, those that are watching also online, uh, media present, and um, everyone else that might be connected to council as well. Can we please start with our karaoke? Thank you. Thank you very much, and um, let's now progress uh, the meeting. So Apologies first, um, just noting that uh, we have Councillor Sam Jennings online uh, and that Councillor Brannigan will be joining us if possible from uh, another venue as well, um, currently out of town, uh, but hopefully um, can get to the meeting later on in the afternoon. Um, we do have, um, first of all, sorry, any declarations of interest today from councillors? Thank you. None. We do have um, two late items, uh, which are 7.3, which is the Waikama Beach Vehicle Access Way topic, and then 7.4, which is the Regional Collaboration on Water Services Delivery Plan. And we will deal with those two items uh, first up in the agenda shortly. Uh, but we have one other member of the public who wishes to talk to us. So could I invite uh, to the table, please. Um, items on the agenda that I would like to talk to is um, especially the ones on the provocation in Tonkin, Tonkin and Taylor report. Um, I'd like to see, may I get the other 26 pages for the report please? Uh, um, 26 pages. It starts at page number 26. Is there 26 other pages to it? Um, what you're referring to there is the agenda page, uh, but it's not the actual report page. Oh, okay. So the, uh, the agenda page is page 20, starts at page 26, but the report itself is complete. Is that? Oh, okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, under this point seven, under risk identification and elevation, it's got... Uh, 2.2 and 2.3 shows what I'm projecting from um, extended points that we know are happening through Woodhaven. Because I come from a swamp liquefaction area, the Arafata wetlands especially I'm talking about, Mr. Uh, Jay often talks about he's got the cleanest vegetables in the Horofanoa because he has a 200 over a 200 metre bore down there. Um, we listened to Dr. Mike Lovejoy the other day talking about the deep bores and liquefaction in Christchurch. And um, I don't know how many deep bores there are in the Horofanoa, and maybe that could be a subject you might like to talk about. But um, the fact that the swamps there, the 200 metre bores there, which makes a uh, earth pocket in the middle of the ground as the water goes out, it doesn't get refilled, and an earthquake zone with the, um, the plate going right through there. Deep holes plus liquefaction uh, equals, no, sorry, earthquake equals liquefaction. Levels of def detail of the aquifer within this area, the Arafata, the Kuku, Waikara, or all, and on the other side of the lake, there's always been salt intrusion. We haven't had it, but 
maybe after Woodhaven we will. And then we've got um, the leachate pond on point seven. It's got health and safety uh, official risks are now included in reports um, going forward. This should also include audits, I think. Uh, our leachate pond is now double the amount of what it used to be. On, um, if anybody's interested in the next three monthly report, I've left them over there on the media thing. Um, this shows you how the ex. Uh, it exceeds all 30 tests that have been carried out on all the different chemical makeups and breakdowns, which all get sucked back through the pot and out to the sea. Um, uh, yes, th this too is a worry for it because, you know, the other thing that I've seen in your reports is that you have ponds and dams that are supposed to be come under the farmers thing or horticulture that are supposed to be um, uh, what's the name you get six five hundred dollars if you don't report your dam and thing leachate pond should go under that and so should the pot pond sorry for just That's reminding it. you that we are talking about liquefaction Li liquefaction but I did say 9.1 did I not did you not hear me say I'm going on to 9.1 which was health and safety Sorry, I didn't write it in my notes. Um, and yes, and that's a double jeopardy situation because of the fact that it gets sucked back out through the pot. Uh, the discharge for the uh, wet, the, the wetland, the water treatment station must be up for renewal, which also is a problem um, because you know Ivan Dow Jones's chemicals is out there at that lake landfill. Anyway, that's about all I'm going to do today, thank you. Um, apart from the committee seems to be wanting to talk about the Salisbury car park. Is that supposed to be developed? Thank you. Any, Any questions? questions for them? Thank you. Okay, so we're now going to move to the first of our late items, which is the um, Waikawa Beach Access Way. And uh, we have a number of uh, speakers, uh, submitters, who wish to talk to us today. Um, and so I'm going to invite you um, soon to begin that process. Uh, but just before we do, I just want to sort of talk to councillors a little bit about... Um, how this process will work and also some instructions for you in terms of what the expectation is as you present to us. Um, so we know how important this conversation is. It does mean that we do need to remain respectful. Uh, it's quite clear from reading the submissions and the numerous amount of additional emails that as mere elected members we have received that this is an emotive and polarising conversation. So it's important that all of you have the opportunity to have your voices heard. As communicated with you, we find ourselves in a position where there has been a change in circumstances. And the advice from council staff is that option one and two are no longer viable options at the moment. It is for this reason that we have reached out to you and encouraged those wishing to be heard to still speak, but in light of the additional information to share your more general views, on whether access should be provided to the beach or in support of option three, no access. It, it is, uh, at this stage, I want to acknowledge the landowners. It is this Fano who have so generously provided the privilege of vehicle access way for many years. As council, we know we don't own the land, and it is my commitment that we will continue to work with the Fano to ensure they maintain rights over their land in a capacity that supports their ambitions as they have so graciously provided this service to the community for many years. I do want to signal to submitters that I won't condone any comments or inferences that create a negative perception or sentiment related to the landowners who are within their rights to exercise self-determination on their own land. So, before I invite submitters up, can I thank you for taking the time so far to have your voices heard through this process. Your input does remain invaluable as we navigate these challenges and work towards finding a suitable resolution 
for all stakeholders involved. Uh, you can take your submissions that are being read, uh, and you have received an email about some of the instructions in terms of what we have. We have uh, a long list of uh, people who do want to speak. Uh, we will be very strict on time. Uh, in fact, my uh, meeting secretary has a bell, and he will give you a warning at 4 minutes 30, and uh, we will, uh, and again at 5 minutes. Uh, but we do have to remain extremely uh, strict on that, sorry. Um, so, there, if you wish to have com um, questions, um, then please allow enough time for that as well. All right, so let's get into it. Our first uh, public participation, do we need to do that first? Okay. As always, I get advice uh, at the right times. Um, so just for councillors' benefit, can we uh, move 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3, that the report uh, be received, that this matter or decision is recognised as significant in terms of Section 76 of the Local Government Act. And 2.3, the council, council formally received the submissions made to the Waikama Beach Vehicle Access Way Consultation and in doing so, note its comprehensive engagement process, which has met the requirements of Section 77 to Section 82 of the Local Government Act. Seconded by Deputy Mayor David. Uh, all those in favour? Against, carried. Thank you. So, can I welcome Colin Peard to the table, please? Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, My Colin. name is uh, Colin Peart. I live at Baikawa Beach. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the council for entering into discussions with the landowners to try and get a solution uh, to the access problem. At the conclusion, uh, <coughs> sorry, at the conclusion of the last meeting last year, one councillor suggested we take our boats down to Otaki. I pay my rates to Harafanua, not Kapiti. I decided to do an analysis based on going to Otaki rather than our beach. So, home to Waik uh, Waikawa Beach at low tide is 10.6 um, kilometres. That's the total trip. That's down there and back. Home to, uh, home to Otaki, um, up the beach, a total trip, round trip is 50k. So when you do the maths, that's a 78% increase in travel and costs. So that's the, one of the reasons I'd like to see access to the beach. I would like to answer one person's submission. They said they've spent 50 years at the beach enjoying catching eels in the river, drake netting for fish, fishing and having fun on the beach, and never ever requiring a vehicle. Well, how lucky you are not to have family members or friends that are disabled due to stroke, Parkinson's, old age, etc., all these people reside or visit Waikawa Beach. I love watching their, I love watching their families enjoying their time as they did when they were young uh, and now having to set a motorised vehicle. Now, one of the other issues was as far as the penguin being run over on the beach, that bird was floating around in the surf dead and only made, it, uh, made land days later. The wheel marks around the bird are from inquisitive people. Uh, as item one and two have now been shelved, I would like to think that item three will be removed from the discussion. Uh, the beach community uh, majority have indicated beach access is required for vehicles. I don't think we need to engage in any more community consultation uh, <coughs> as the results speak for themselves. We do not need to listen to more and more people giving reasons for and against beach access. The submissions are in and we have the answer. What we need now is a solution to the problem. I know there are other people here today who would like to offer their thoughts on a solution. So on that note, I say thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, just to just remind you, Colin, just in case there are any questions from any of the elected members. Or they appear not. Thank you for your time. <laughs> uh, could I welcome uh, Kurt Renner to the table? Uh, 
for those that don't know, it's the right hand button on that uh, little microphone in front of you, and it will turn red when you've pushed it so that you uh, know that you're on. My first ever visit to the council. <laughs> um, uh, kia ora, your worship, Mayor Bernie, uh, council members, councillors, um, I think Monique, who's the CEO, should be around, and council officers. I thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'd like to acknowledge my fellow pro access speakers and supporters, as well as the no access supporters, as together we all form part of the amazing community that is at Waikawa Beach. With the help of this council, we look forward to working together to find a practical and fair solution to our community beach access issue. I would also like to thank the Huronui Trust, being the private landowners who have for many years generously allowed myself, my whanau, and the whole Waikawa Beach community to travel across their land to access our beautiful Waikawa Beach. I am Kurt Renner. My family have two properties at Waikawa Beach. Our place is the one with the milk bottles hanging off the hanging off the uh, letterbox in the village. Um, I've been coming to Waikawa Beach for over 18 years. So yeah, although I'm just a newbie to Waikawa Beach compared to many of you in the community, our family has had a deep connection to Waikawa Beach for over 30 years. In fact, my mother-in-law, Rosemary Brereton, used to be the CEO of this very council in the late 1990s. Rosemary passed away at a very young age in 2013 and left her daughters the house at Waikawa Beach. I even proposed to my wife, my now wife, on Waikawa Beach and I was very lucky she said yes, also lucky not to lose the ring because I did drop it in the sand. Um, our extended family spend a lot of time at Waikawa Beach throughout the whole year, but in particular over summer where we can have upwards of 20 guests staying at our staying at our place. Um, we always have a total Kiwi summer, with barbecues, football games, taking part in boat day, sports day, the AGM as a member of Waikawa Beach Rip Pairs Association. Plus, of course, loads of time spent on Waikawa Beach itself, swimming, boogie boarding, beach cricket and family picnics. As a family, we mostly access the beach at the end of Mangapedale Street being the closest point to get to the sea from the village. It is still some distance from the access point that takes you down to the sand. You then need to get to the sea, which is more than 650 metres away from the access point. And usually you have to go a bit more to be safe, um, as you tend to swim a couple of hundred metres further away from the river mouth, because the river mouth um, causes the rip and you do tend to get dragged that way, so let's say 850 metres. This is an important factor for everyone here to understand. Waikawa Beach, the part that everyone uses to swim in the sea and to fish, etc., is minimum 650 metres away from Mangapiro Access. But realistically, this is called 850 metres away to play it safe. Over the sand, some hard, some soft, and some through at least, you have to go through at least one stream. The beach slash sea is not like other beaches that are immediately next to the car park. Also, once you go to the beach, there's three, approximately three kilometres of empty beach to use, so it is never busy, even at the height of summer. Yes, I'm a vocal supporter of continued beach access for all, regardless of people's personal mobility and protecting the environment. I believe you can have both, and I'm not just saying this, I'm prepared to put significant funds in to back this up and make it happen. We as a community can do this and we can do it together. Because I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> this whole issue does feel like a problem looking for a solution. And there has been a strong majority of 70% of submitters who have said they wish to retain beach access. Um, this is not about can cars drive on the beach, because they can. If you close the access, they still can. It is a legal road. Um, and the cruel joke to everyone uh, is, for, is everyone, that everyone can come from north and south to Waikawa Beach, but us locals are unable to access it. You might say, so what, Wook? Well, my mother, Tanya Renner, has a message to pass on to you. Please don't forget your elders. 
my mum is 17, largely in good health, but has osteoarthritis, and she cannot walk that distance, and she cannot walk the tracks at Ray Mackay either. Um, so this year, my mum has not partaken in, in any of the family time at the beach, as I imagine a lot of people in the same boat. The mobility aids that have been shown to us to use... Sorry, I, Kate, I am going to have to stick to my words and, and interrupt you there. Um, look, thank you very much. Um, appreciate your very comprehensive uh, submission. Um, can I also acknowledge your mother-in-law, who I knew... Uh, Rosemary, obviously, um, uh, for some time when she was the first woman chief executive of this district. And we're very fortunate to have the second uh, female uh, chief executive as well now. So, uh, look, appreciate everything that you're doing in this space and um, thank you. Can I now welcome Jeannie Trull? Jeannie, you just turn that off. That's it. That's Thank fine. you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, I represent a group of 13 co-owners of a property at Waikawa. We've been there for 36 years. Um, they're not here today, but uh, our partners, our children, our grandchildren, our uh, uh, friends, our disabled relatives stand with us um, to... Uh, to make the submission. We were probably naive not to make 50 submissions in that one representing all of us by now realise it. But we've had a lot of experience of being um, people at the beach who, uh, who um, have experienced the highs and lows of the um, beach experience and the vehicle access issue. We strongly oppose uh, vehicle access. Um, Wakawa Beach is the jewel in the crown of Horofenua. We all know that. It's a beautiful, uh, unique environment. The river, the sand dunes are divine. The wildlife is rare, unique, and under threat. We have this marvellous environment that we all love, whatever side we're on. We all love it. But it's under threat. Primarily, it's under threat from climate change, actually. And we all know that over the next 10, 20 years, all of our coasts are going to be further eroded by extreme weather events, and it's going to get tougher and tougher to maintain the kind of fragile beach environments that we have. Um, any um, belt access is going to be destroyed. We've actually seen that with a lot of attempts to redivert the, the uh, river, so it's actually a bit of a waste of money, to be quite frank. Um, but further, vehicles will continue to, uh, they will enhance and um, accelerate the erosion and degradation of the beach as we face the challenges of climate change. So that alone, I think, is a reason to say no to vehicle access. And councils all over the country, you will know this, are grappling with this issue about vehicle access. And council by council are voting against vehicle access in many, many cases to... Um, beaches because they're recognising that as kaitiaki of these wonderful, unique environments, um, we want to preserve them, we want to save them, we want to keep them as safe and as um, uh, uh, pristine as we can. Look, we've got, we've got, we've had lots of submissions about, about the birds, about the uh, resting seals, all of those things. Um, I personally have had a couple of really horrible incidents with um, uh, with vehicles on the beach. Um, playing with my granddaughter on the beach, uh, a young man on a on a four wheel drive quad thing came along, almost knocked us over, almost killed my granddaughter. It was incredibly frightening. Uh, another time, a, a bunch of boys on quads chased my terrified dog up the beach. Um, and laughed and laughed and laughed. And when I called out to them, they gave me the fingers and said, stuff off, we have got a right to be here. And many, many people at the beach can testify to these sorts of examples. Now, I know that many of you who want vehicle access say, but we're really responsible and we want to take our fishing gear and our disabled relatives down to the beach and we'll be really responsible. And I know that and I know and understand 
what you want in terms of what you've, you've had in the past. But opening up access opens it up to a very large section of the community, some of whom are the teenage kids of the people uh, making these submissions, who don't, who don't care and are very irresponsible and are damaging our fragile sand dunes. So, that's, um, so there's a safety issue there. There's a peace and tranquility issue there. And there's a, um, opening the floodgates to, um, to people who will come and disrespect and misuse our environment. You've got the choice about whether to kind of placate this very well-organised group who want immediate access right now um, versus the long-term, big-picture environmental issues of retaining this jewel in our crown for posterity and keeping it as good as we can for as long as we can as we fight climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Jeannie, um, the way you delivered that. Um, sorry, did you have a question? Can I have a question? Yes, certainly. <coughs> um, you're assuming that uh, beach access is only for able-bodied people to exclude a large portion of our population that may not be able to walk down to the beach. Look, I have so much sympathy for people who have uh, access issues. I have people in my own family who are only able to use a limited part of the beach and the river because they can't walk. It's the reality of life. There are, there are special places in our beautiful New Zealand country that not everybody can get to. Not everybody can climb the highest mountain. Not everybody can walk on every beach. It doesn't mean that we sacrifice so much for those people, but I absolutely support better pedestrian access, and I also think we just have to think about how to enjoy the bits of the beach that are accessible, because they are. And, you know, my, in my own family, we do that too. So. Thank you. Could I now welcome Brian Mitch? Well there, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. This is on already. Yeah, it's all go. Yeah. Um, so uh, basically, I've been a resident at Waikawa Beach and Rape Power for the last 40 years, so I'm probably a new boot as well, really. Um, but really, my I'm a totally against beach access, I always have been. Uh, we found it uh, during that time to be nothing more than a menace people being on the beach with cars, uh, motorbikes, four wheel drives in the dunes. Uh, it hasn't been a help to anyone. They cut up the uh, areas of grass, which is there for stability. Um, and really, you've got to ask the question, why do we need it? Now, there's, I've heard mentioned emergency services to get onto the beach. Realistically, fire engines and ambulances aren't going to be driving through the sand onto the beach. That's not a real option. And in a real emergency, helicopters are going to be the, the case for any vac or anything like that, or stretch it out. Um, I do have a strong understanding of the need for the elderly and handicapped, and I do wonder that perhaps, I, health and safety-wise, I don't think it's a great option to be driving people who are invalids onto a beach, which could potentially again then get stuck in the sand, and put them at risk. Is that a great option anyway? Um, is, an, is there another option there? Could we consider modifying bridge access? Could the existing pedestrian bridge be modified to give access for um, mobility scooters or vehicles to be used in certain areas. Think change the equation. If this is, if we only need access for fishermen, and that's why I'm sort of getting the gist here, is basically, yeah, when I see the families down there with granny and bits and pieces, that's great. But if we're just doing this for fishermen, you've got to then equate the dollar value to the cost of catch, and basically we subsidising thousand dollars a fish. I don't know how does this work. Is and am I going to get a rates rebate since I've never used that access and I've never caught a fish? <laughs> so, realistically, why are we doing it? Um, what's the cost to council and what are the benefits? Um, I can over the years, I imagine over 40 years, that I've been paying taxes, uh, a fair whack of money's been paid. I've never had a dispute about that road access onto the beach, it was there when I got there, you just lived with it. But it's now become to a point where it's unmanageable. The river's ripping it out every year. It's getting worse. It's going to get worse with climate change. The costs are going to go up. Yes, you can move it somewhere further down the beach, and then you're going to have more problems there as more erosion issues kick in. You're, you're just moving the problem. Do we really need it? 
currently, I believe we're looking at a rates increase of between 15 to 21% being looked at. Any rates increase, I would hate to see any of my money chucked into a pile of sand on the beach to then get washed out again and another one loaded behind it. That's really not good use of taxpayer money. Uh, the other problem with um, beach access is who polices it. Um, the, by law, you've got to be a registered, warranted vehicle on a beach because it's a road, and also the drivers have got to be uh, licensed. The number of quad bikes, or well, no quad bikes, are road legal anyway. They're designed for farms. They're not designed for roads. Um, most of the tractors won't be road legal. Uh, who's policing that? I know if you'd ring the cops and actually ask, oh, look, I've had a problem on the beach on sleep with uh, close misses, they just say, don't want to know, too hard. So basically you end up with this uh, vigilante rogue communities, which basically can do their own thing. Is that a, is that a good option? Is, is the next step that uh, basically we can build houses without building permits? I mean, it's, where, do, where do you draw the line? And I'm not saying it's a council issue to be policing this either. It's a, it's a hard one, but somehow someone has to address that. Who is going to address, police it? At the moment, um, they've lost access, and so they've then gone around cutting down pillars and giving access through walkways. So there's a disregard for council property and a disregard for the rules, and that concerns me. And that's not going to change. If you do a decision they don't like, they're just going to do what they bloody want. So as far as I'm concerned, we do not need access. We should not have access. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Any Questions, quick ones. Again, appreciate your submission. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, could I now welcome Ewan Plough to the table, please? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, your Worship, councillors. Um, members of the, of the public and, of course, council staff, etc. Um, my name's Ewan Plough. I've owned property at Waikawa Beach for some 34 plus years. Uh, during that time, my family's grown up there. Uh, yes, as referred to by the last speaker, fishing has been part of that. But I was lucky I had um, many older people uh, local iwi and older people in the community who taught me how to respect the beach. And it's with that in mind that we all should be thinking about. It's not just about conservationists thinking that. As a fisherman, as an outdoor person, I think about that all the time. I appreciate this opportunity to talk, but I think it's firstly important as her, his worship and previous speakers to acknowledge the landowners. Without them, we wouldn't have had what we have had. And it's with that in mind that I would like the council to continue their negotiations with the family and with the landowners. I believe that might enable a shorter term uh, solution. Uh, to access, and I believe that might give council and other people time to consider what is the real long-term view. I come from an earth movement contracting background in the Wairapa, family background. I, I have spent time as a, student, as a youth student working on catchment board schemes over the Wairapa. I have seen what Mother Nature can do, we cannot compete against Mother Nature. In that regard, I've seen the beach change. We've seen the beach in terms of flood uh, times, where the water used to flow out and used to, down the southern end, flow across the top of the beach and out, and it enabled the water to get away rather than cutting into the bank. I believe, and I hope, the Council can refer to their earlier studies, because I'm not sure that the way the plant, I'm not against planting, but I'm not sure that the way the planting is done is enabling now with the bit rise in sand at the southern end and the estuary is allowing the water to get away. And that's why 
I believe, that is coming in. And that experience goes back to watching the lake, the opening of uh, Lake Ferry over the Warrapa, then done, uh, and when it's done, and what the impacts of that is. Yes, I'm disappointed too about the actions of some people in our community and the actions they've taken into their own hands. But I believe the time is now. We've had a almost a referendum, and it's to me it's been a 70% uh, mandate to the council to maintain the opening, but continue uh, access, vehicle access on the beach. But we need to move together, move forward together. This is not about they and us or them and you. It's it's about getting on with how we can work together. And I'm very um, encouraged by some of the offers that have come forward to maybe work on a system uh, or a project to get access restored. I believe the Council's first action should be to reconsider option 3.4 to perhaps amend that to see whether a short-term solution uh, can be negotiated with the landowners. In that regard, I think it is probably time that the council, combined council and local community do formally apologise, thank and apologise to the uh, own current landowners. I've reflected in my report on uh, safety issues, traffic, etc. I don't think waiting for a helicopter to bring a defibrillator to someone who's having a heart attack walking down to the Oteki screen is the way to go ahead. How can you get a, a defibrillator to a person in that very important 20 minute period, the sunshine hour or minutes or whatever it's called? So with that, Your Honour, I conclude what I want to present. Appreciate that. Thank you, Jan. Thank you for your comments. Um, any quick questions? Thank you. Appreciate your time. Can I now uh, welcome Peter Sullivan, who's representing the Waikawa Beach Road Pass Association. Thank you, Your, your Worship. Your okay. Councillors. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to um, address the meeting today. As, as uh, the Mayor said, I'm Pat O'Sullivan. I'm the co-chair of the Waikawa Beach Ratepayers Association. Um, have been for only a short period of time and actually have only been a resident in Waikawa Beach for a short period of time. Well, excuse me for a second. I'll put my glasses on. Um, As I said, I'm the co-chair. Um, my co-chair, Deborah Betts, is also here. Um, she will make a presentation, I think, pretty closely following me, uh, which will be somewhat at, at odds with uh, um, the presentation that I'm about to make. Uh, and I would point out at the outset that um, these are not my personal views. These are the views uh, expressed by the majority of residents and ratepayers in Waikawa Beach. Um, the association made a submission to council, some copies of which I have here, hopefully some at least of you have read that, so obviously I won't take time here relitigating that, um, but I will actually just quote one passage from it which um, says the uh, Waikawa Beach Ratepayers Association finds itself in the an enviable position of being mandated to represent the interests of the community at large, but finds itself dealing with the community quite severely and in many cases passionately divided over this particular issue. Uh, in fact, our own committee is not unanimous in support of either position, those positions being access to the beach by vehicles or no access. Um, however, a recent poll of the committee members reveals that the majority support the reinstatement and ongoing maintenance of vehicular access, and in fact, um, it's that that has driven the theme, if you like, of the submission made to council by the Waikawa Beach Ratepayers Association. 
Um, I would point to the outcomes of two surveys, uh, one um, undertaken by the association itself and the other obviously the public consultation process undertaken by the council. Uh, in both cases, uh, support for vehicular access to the beach um, is in excess of 60%. In the case of their own um, survey, 63%. In the case of the council consultation pro process, 69.96%. With the WBRA um, survey, 37% opposed, uh, and in the council, 30.04%. So there's a clear majority. It's obvious that uh, the residents and ratepayers, a majority, want to be able to get vehicles onto the beach for the various reasons that we've already heard and I'm sure we'll hear further. Um, however, it's got to be acknowledged that 30% uh, or in excess actually of 30% in both cases is not an inconsequential number and the concerns of the people uh, who make up that 30% are certainly acknowledged by the Waikawa Beach Ratepayers Association most of us are residents there. Most of us live there because of the environment, not in spite of the environment. Um, and so we're equally supportive of preserving the environment to the best uh, of our ability. But at the same time, people have bought properties and live there for other reasons as well. And that includes access to the beach. It includes fishing. It includes launching boats. You can't do that currently. And unless some sort of solution to this problem is found, um, they're not going to be able to do it. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to get through all of this, obviously. Um, I, I just finished by saying that uh, thank you for the uh, for the council um, report, and I'll draw your attention to two clauses of that: clause five, five, and five six, um, and in there's a bit here, but I can't cover it. In the interest, namely, and I'm quoting here, in, in the interest, namely, pro protection of the environment, private property, personal security, I would suggest a viable secure, uh, solution to this has got to be found. There's a great deal of animosity there, with, and we've heard already how passionate people from either side of the argument are. And unless some sort of viable solution is found here, that's going to continue. The unauthorised damage to the environment is going to continue and probably get worse as we approach the next summer, uh, and particularly the white bait season. Um, okay, thank you for the opportunity, you, Pat. Um, can I just, um, in thanking you, acknowledge the work that you do on behalf of the Road Post Association. It does require members of the community to step up to those sorts of positions and look after the interests of, of your community and we do appreciate the work that you do in that space. Thank you. Thank you. Can I now welcome uh, Jan Jordan to the table? <coughs> Thanks, Jen. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. And thank you, um, Mayor Wandon and councillors, for the opportunity to speak with you today. Also just want to take this opportunity to say a thank you to the council staff, who I know this issue has greatly increased the workload that you've all had to manage, um, and it's brought its own trials and tribulations. So thank you. One more thing before I start. You're going to hear from more than one Jordan today. Just so um, to allay any suspicions of family takeover bids, um, there are several Jordans living at Waikawa Beach. None of us actually are related. Um, we've all got great taste in where we want to live. So with my partner, I've owned property at Waikawa Beach for many years, been a permanent resident since 2020. And I've been distressed increasingly um, as my realisation has grown regarding the fragility of our natural environment. And it's one of the most valuable resources that we have in our community. But I've also been distressed by the rift driven because of opposing ideas about vehicle access. And that's really been threatening another of our most valuable resources. And that's the people who make up our community. 
And when I began thinking about my stance on this issue, I believed in seeking a solution that would meet in some way the interests of both those who wanted vehicle access and those who did not. And I believed initially in a middle ground that would allow restrictive access for legitimate users um, to launch boats or to transport those with disabilities while finding ways to greater protect the environment. I have to say I've progressively shifted my stance over the last few months. And this is because the reactions and behaviours of some of those wanting beach vehicle access have, to be honest, appalled me. And they've actually prompted me to think much more deeply about what's really at stake here. And I wanted to understand why they felt so entitled to drive on the beach that they'd keep damaging the land belonging to the local Muratana family, who, as we've heard so generously, had granted access for so many years. I wondered why their rights justified them destroying the spinifex plantings done by council and by members of the environment group of the Rate Players Association and by others in the community. Why did they believe they had a right to cut chains and to remove bollards and repeatedly ignore every council sign and directive? And why did they think it was acceptable to verbally abuse and physically intimidate those with a different view? Now, a common response has been that the 99% of responsible vehicle users should not be blamed or deprived of access because of the disrespectful actions of 1%. The 1% figure is not evidence-backed. Instead, we have a lot of visual evidence of convoys of quad bikes, cars and motorbikes destroying dune vegetation and threatening birds just so they can joyride up and down the beach. Nobody disabled in sight, no fishing rods in sight either. So this current debate has really prompted me to think about how the current division is often seen. The rights of those wanting vehicle access versus the rights of those wanting a vehicle-free beach. It's not an issue that money can solve. What I want to argue for today is a deeper right that I believe cannot be ignored and one that underscores both sides of the issue. It's not a human right to have access or to not have access, but it's the rights of the land that came before us and will live hopefully after us. And we have a history of using that land as if we were entitled to its abundance. And now we're surrounded by evidence of how short-term and irresponsible that attitude is with overfished seas, eroded shorelines, extinct birds, depleted resources. It's irrelevant to say 99% are responsible when damage is done by just 1%. One quad bike can destroy an endangered bird's nest. One vehicle can damage shellfish. One motorbike wreck dune vegetation. Our beaches are the thin border protecting our land. They're a fragile ecosystem. And as kaitiaki, all of us, councils included, share the responsibility of caring for them. So in an age of rapidly advancing climate change, why would we not do everything we can to keep vehicles off our beaches and protect them? Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Appreciate those thoughts. Um, and, yeah, thank you for your submission. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I now welcome uh, Deborah Betts on behalf of Walk On Waikawa. Welcome, Deborah. Welcome. Um, thank you, Mayor, fellow councillors, for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm here as the co-chair of the Waikawa Beach Rate Pays Association to read a statement from the Walk On Waikawa submission. So, this statement makes three key points in line with the formal submission made by Walk On Waikawa. Support for Waikawa Beach being vehicle free is strong and there is a golden opportunity for the Council to make Waikawa Beach a destination of choice for Horofanua and the wider region. Any costs associated with creating and maintaining a vehicle access will only grow over time, putting a burden on the current and future ratepayers. 
And thirdly, the actions of the supporting vehicle access have been destructive and intimidating. Auckland Waikawa are a group of 40 Waikawa residents and property owners with a vision to establish Waikawa Beach as a destination of choice for Harafanua in the wider regional communities, where people can enjoy a pedestrian-centric beach experience without the need to be constantly vigilant for the danger pose, traffic poses to children and horses or experiencing the noise disruption and environmental damage caused by motorbikes and other vehicles. Support for a vehicle-free Waikawa Beach is strong. 37 of those support surveyed by the Waikawa Beach Ratepayers Association want vehicle access to Waikawa Beach to remain closed. Increasingly, New Zealanders have accepted the ensuring environmental protection requires putting limits on people's activities where these activities harm or threaten the environment. Other councils have already recognised this and moved to restrict, limit or ban vehicles from their beaches. We believe the council can be on the right side of history with regard to protecting the Waikawa beach environment. Conversely, if council decides to proceed with vehicle access um, to Waikawa beach ratepayers, will be saddled with constantly growing financial costs in the future. Any vehicle access will also come at a cost to beach users who lose safety and tranquility, wildlife for those feeding, and daily life are very much disrupted and damaged to the beach environment. By neglecting this opportunity to protect Waikawa Beach, the Council risks reputational damage, both now and in the future, when it has to walk back its support for an unsustainable beach access. Council has the opportunity to enhance its reputation by providing a pedestrian experience not available on Horofanua's other public beaches. So, why have we asked for the statement to be read on our behalf rather than standing before you and speaking for ourselves? Members of Walk on Waikawa have experienced abuse and intimidation from people who see vehicle access to Waikawa Beach as a right to be pursued at any cost. These same people have driven through private land, sawn down posts on Rain Kay Beach pedestrian walkway and driven their vehicles past council signs prohibiting vehicle access through these walkways. They have destroyed spinifex which holds the dunes together. They are the same people who in their submissions will, will say that only 1% of vehicles on the beach cause issues for people, wildlife and dunescape. This behaviour is deplorable and unacceptable. We have requested that the statement be read out by a representative from the Waikawa Beach Ratepayers Association in order to become in order to avoid becoming the target for further abuse. We would also ask Council to urgently restore the damaged walkway and reinforce its pedestrian use with bollards, rope and plantings. In summary, Walker and Waikawa believe there is strong support for a pedestrian-centric beach at Waikawa and that keeping the beach vehicle-free will make Waikawa Beach a destination of choice for people in the Horofanua region and beyond. The costs of creating and maintaining any vehicle access to Waikawa Beach are significant and likely to become prohibitive over time. We appreciate and value the opportunity to make a submission on the options for vehicle access at Waikawa Beach. We oppose vehicle access for the few at the expense of the many, the wildlife and the environment. Council now has an opportunity to be on the right side of history to protect the precious beach environment and to make Waikawa Beach a jewel in the crown of Horofanua that can be enjoyed by generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, it's, can I just echo and acknowledge my early wisdom, Pat? On, uh, I know you're co-chair, so I appreciate, again, the work that you do in that space. Could I now welcome David Nolder? Uh, Kia ora David uh, Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I've been at the beach for over 40 years, a property owner for over 20. Uh, I just wanted to start by really acknowledging the generosity of the landowners. So for all of the time that I've been at the beach and extensively used the beach for fishing and other purposes, I've accessed your land, so I really appreciate that. Uh, I know time is short, so I'll keep this short. 
Um, a lot of information in the report, several hundred pages. As I read it, there are a few messages that really uh, clearly st uh, stand out. First is really strong support. 70% of people support continued beach access. And that's both in terms of total submissions and those who are residents at the beach. Many common reasons for why beach access, vehicle access to the beach should be maintained, including particularly a quality of access, regardless of their personal or physical circumstances, um, community safety and the ability of, uh, uh, to access the beach in an emergency, um, which actually does happen. When I was white bailing with my brother uh, many, many years ago, he had an epileptic fit and nearly drowned. If it wasn't for that, I don't know how that might have turned out. Um, an ambulance did get on the beach, by the way. Um, preserving the ability to fish, surf, kayak, take families down to the beach. These are real family things that people do. Uh, and recognising the reality of how people actually use the beach. Plus, recognising the very minimal level of services and support that the beach community gets from council, continuing to enable beach access doesn't really seem like a big ask. Looking at the report, um, I couldn't actually understand the disconnect between what I read as the recommendation uh, compared to the weight of submissions. In the initial report, it said that, um, uh, to, uh, that the recommendation for the council not to facilitate beach access uh, for vehicles. Uh, and I'm not entirely clear why options one and two are off the table at this time, or precisely what would be the criteria to put those options back on the table. Um, there's been some emotive statements uh, today, um, particularly around anecdotes that I think overeat the situation. Uh, this is being presented as a binary debate, a choice between vehicles versus the environment. Uh, this is not the case. Just because I take fishing gear down to the beach on a tractor doesn't mean I seek to destroy the environment. Many environmentalists drive cars and ride quad bikes, right? We're we need to be really clear on the problem that we're trying to solve here. Um, we can continue to use and enjoy the natural environment um, while enjoying it. The beach is here for all of us to use, right? Whether it's birds or wildlife, pedestrians, swimmers, fishers, daydreamers, everybody. Options one and two enable this, option three does not. Um, as with anything, there's extremes at either end of the spectrum. So what we need here, I think, is a balanced and rational fact-based decision based on common sense, based on a view around what the majority of people want, how the majority of people act, the majority of time. Voting for option three does not mean no vehicles on the beach. Vehicles still come up from Otaku or down from Kuku. The only thing that removing vehicle access from Waikawa ensures is that the only vehicles on the beach are out of towners. So voting for option three means voting for no access to vehicles from locals only. So I think we really need to be clear on the problem we're trying to solve here. Um, the fundamental role of council is to facilitate solutions to local needs and to manage local infrastructure such as roads. I didn't make this up, it's on your website and your, your accountability documents. So, in coming to your decision as councillors, I think it would be helpful to ask yourself the following questions. What's the most inclusive option? Um, and that, by inclusive, I mean uh, not just those who are physically able to use the beach for walking. What enables people to use the beach as they have for decades? What best reflects what most of the community wants? and what best reflects the role of council. And the answer to all of those is to continue to enable vehicle access to the beach of Waikawa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dale. Um, just noting that when officers present the report to councillors shortly, you will get a clearer picture of why option one and two are not available at the moment. Um, so that has been explained to councillors already, but um, the report will state that what as to why we can't do that at the moment. Uh, but thank you for your submission. Appreciate the way that it was delivered. Thank you. Yes. Uh, next we have Raz Jordan.
Kia ora, many thanks for allowing me to speak today. One of the recommendations put forward for councillors to consider today clearly supports council's outstanding environment outcomes, namely that council does not facilitate vehicle access to Waikawa Beach. Ratepayers and visitors have long been denied the opportunity to choose a beach free of vehicles from amongst Horofanua's many attractions. As more and more vehicles drive along the beaches, they're becoming ever more intrusive and disturbing. Council today has a unique opportunity to turn towards the future by creating the first pedestrian-friendly beach in Horofanua. Councillors don't need to actively stop vehicle access at Waikawa Beach. Nature did that six months ago and numerous times in recent years. Councillors can create this new facility for the public without any financial cost beyond a few notices and signs. This would be a new option for Horofanoa, promoting and supporting health and well-being. Vehicles can, of course, continue to enjoy the excellent beach access provided at all other Horofanoa beaches and also at Ōtaki. That simple step in itself would bring enormous benefit to the Horofanoa community and beyond. However, councillors could take an additional step towards council's outstanding environment outcomes. First, as others have pointed out, vehicles can still access Waikar Beach from other locations such as Ōtaki. You've already heard in submissions about the problems caused by vehicles coming from elsewhere. I propose that in consultation with the Waikawa private landowners and the Kuku community, councillors exclude all vehicles from the public beach areas between the southern boundary with Kapiti and Kuku. That would also create a quiet, relaxing and peaceful beach where people can enjoy traditional activities like dog walking, swimming, kayaking, fishing, beach sports, horse riding, picnics and family outings without needing to be constantly alert for and dodge vehicles. It would also create a beach where the flora and fauna can thrive rather than being constantly degraded. This directly aligns with the outcome of improving our natural environment for current and future generations to enjoy. Second, submissions have made it clear that the three pedestrian accesses to Waikawa Beach which cross public land need to be substantially improved to help people with disabilities or who want to wheel recreation gear to the beach. Some people have to resort to using vehicles because the pedestrian tracks are too long, too soft, or blocked by barriers designed to exclude motorbikes. And the bikes, by the way, don't care. They just go through them anyway. I propose that Council invest in creating one or more first-class deliberately designed and engineered pedestrian tracks so that more people can easily access and enjoy the natural beach area on foot. A good starting point could be the Pedestrian Recreation Reserve track at 60 Ray McKay Grove as it's comparatively short and exits onto a part of the beach popular for swimming and picnics. This directly aligns with the outcome of being able to access and enjoy natural areas and public spaces. Meanwhile, Horofanoa still provides excellent beach access for vehicles to its other beaches. By making Waikawa a pedestrian friendly beach, councillors can expand the facilities the region provides, allowing people to freely choose between vehicle access directly onto a beach and a quiet and relaxing family friendly beach environment accessible on foot and rich in natural flora and fauna, a draw card for visitors and a service to ratepayers looking for far horizons, rest and relaxation. The opportunity to get out of the hustle and bustle of heavily trafficked daily life. A decision not to facilitate vehicle access is a decision in favour of health and well-being for people, plants, shellfish, birds and the other wildlife that rely on Waikawa Beach for their survival. It will enhance the reputation of Horofanoa by making a new option available for residents and visitors alike. A relaxing and tranquil beach that puts pedestrians and wildlife first. 
Ki a horo, ki a horo te marino, ki a whakapapa pounamu te moana, ki a tere te kārohi rohi i mua i tauhuarahi. May the calm be widespread. May the ocean glisten as green stone. May the shimmer of light ever dance across your pathway. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. Appreciate that. Um, as always, um, your contribution is welcome. So, thank you. There don't appear to be any questions, so I appreciate that. Cheers. Right. Could I now welcome Donna Annette Bright. Thank you. Hi, my name's Donna. I've lived in Waikawa for a long time. My use of the beach is for horse riding and dog walking. Um, I do not take a car to the beach, but I do support the rights of others to do so. Um, I feel that I want to be inclusive of everybody's hobbies, that my neighbour with his boat should be able to take his boat and launch it. Um, I also am concerned about safety issues. Having experienced an emergency on the beach where the ambulance couldn't get to the injured person, I flagged down a four-wheel drive and put the injured person and they took it to the ambulance. Um, also, recently when there was a fire, I'm very aware of the fact we have one road in and no other way out. If the wind had changed and come in my direction, I have to evacuate. If that fire is going across the road, then what do I do? Being able to take the four-wheel drive down the beach and escape that way would be quite nice. Um, you know, I recognise that also the river is a problem and the putting car access through that location is probably not a great idea. And I think we should maybe look at other locations. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. I am concerned about horse access if we lose that access because we're not allowed to go across the walkways and... Ray McKay, um, and would like to know what's happening with horse access, being that the beach is our only legal riding area in Horofanua. We have no other horse riding areas in Horofanua. So if I can't get to the beach, then where am I supposed to go? Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Donna. Appreciate your views. Um, could I now welcome... Um, Christian Kismal. Sorry, turn that off, Christian. Sorry. <laughs> there you are. Yeah, technology. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, present to this matter. Uh, my name is Christian Casbolt. I um, am a landowner at Waikawa Beach. I've had our property for 17 years. Prior to that, we used to come to the beach regularly and partake in the general activities um, over a sort of 10 or 15 year period previously. Um, I support the question for access for vehicles. And selected option two via the consultation process is the best choice from what I consider to be limited options. In summary, my reasons for supporting vehicle access are access has historically been enabled and this was instrumental in our decision to purchase our property for the lifestyle options as provided. Access supports traditional beach activities for a significant majority of residents as evidenced through consultation with 70% of thereabouts of supporting access with a similar number of non-residents also supporting access. Many of the activities require significant amounts of general gear, such as boating, kayaks, long line fishing gear, white baiting nets, and general family activities requiring uh, reasonable access by vehicle. We participate in all those activities. Access provides opportunities for elderly and disabled persons to participate in the activities. Pedestrian access ways are totally unsuitable because of the distance and ground conditions. Because access has not been available, our example is shared with my wife's parents and a disabled brother were unable to access the beach and chose not to come to the beach this summer for that reason. I know of many others who have had similar circumstances and it was obvious this summer that without vehicle access, visitor numbers 
and the use of the beach was reduced significantly. S16, for vehicles you need to travel 25 kilometres through Otaki, a 50 kilometre round trip to access the beach adjacent to the village, which is simply not practical, defies common sense and completely at odds with what the majority of the community want and have historically enjoyed. Access provides for emergency response if required and as an alternative route to and from the village should Waikawa Beach Road become a new zone, which it does from time to time. Equally, no excess will most likely negatively impact house values in, in the area. When reviewing the reasons submitted against access, primarily environmental and safety concern, it's my view that these issues can be mitigated and are not well evidenced and on balance are less persuasive than the reasons to support access. In fact, from my experience, having motorised locals on the beach has and is more likely to negate any potential issues as we all have a shared view to respect in the environment and community. Either way, vehicles will be on the beach from other access points and their occupants will possibly have less connection to the community. As mentioned earlier, the options provided in the consultation process were limited and in my opinion, continued a long-standing reluctance by Council over many years to move away from relying on private landowners and find a suitable solution that provides the community with reliable access to the beach. I referred to the district plan in 2015, and I quote, the coastal uh, settlements of the district, particularly like Wadawari Beach, Foxton Beach and Waikawa Beach, have all been subjected to significant levels of subdivision and development over the last 10 years. Then asked the question why, for example, as the land was developed and subdivided around Ray Mackay Grove, was access point not established in conjunction with the eastern access points? Also quoting from the district plan, objective 5.2.1, public access to and along the coast, and I quote, to maintain the existing level of public access to and along the coast and ensure that any new access is provided in a way that does not adversely affect the recognised value of the coastal environment. Also, is interested in reading the recent report, there appears to be uh, some bias towards the concerns raised by the No Access Group in regards to some of the language used. As I'm running out of time, I won't quote that, but it may be worth revisiting that. In summary, the people have spoken, 7% want access to the beach by vehicle. This is not entitlement, as has been suggested, but simply reflects the history and tradition of the community. Restricting access would be an affront to the consultative and democratic process. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Christian. Appreciate your time as well. Um, can I now welcome Stephen Griffiths? Just push that right one, Stephen. That's it. Well done. Hey, thank you all. Um, appreciate everyone's time. Look, I don't want to be long, but definitely want to echo the um, generosity of the current landowners for providing us access like they have so kindly over the years. <coughs> Um, and get straight to the point. Look, I don't, I don't think um, there is now any issue because we have um, restricted access. So the issue we're really talking about is access or no access. I know the first couple of scenarios have changed <coughs> in recent weeks, but seventy percent of the Harfner people have clearly <coughs> acknowledged that they would prefer access. Um, so in my view, council has a mandate um, from the majority to somehow create an opportunity to honour that request. Um, restricting back beach access to walking only, in my view, is not sharing the beach. <coughs> um, look, there's some Waikawa residents who would only benefit from walking as their homes are nearby. So let me explain this further. Um, accessibility and inclusivity, which we've touched on, um, is providing vehicle access to the beach. This ensures individuals with mobility challenges or families with young children, they can enjoy the beach experience like we used to as younger kids. I can tell you from experience, it's very hard to push a pram through soft sand. <coughs> it's even more difficult to carry a chilli bin, deck chairs and beach toys over a couple hundred metres from your vehicle. Now, our vehicle access promotes inclusivity and allows a wider range of community members to 
access and enjoy the natural beauty of life. Now this includes aged care people who we so often see um, being taken for a visit out to the beach by the carers. People living in Harfano to enjoy the open beaches this region offers. <clears throat> These are people like myself who live in town and love to go out to the beach. This is um, could be a young family who rent in town. Um, they might live in town because they work in town, and the beach is often an outlet for them on a weekend. This is also a family from Wellington who love to escape their 400 square meter section and get out to the wide open spaces that Harfano offers. Offers. <coughs> so to the councillors, you have been elected by the people of Harfana. The interest of the core of our region is the wide open spaces, that's the beaches, what we promote. Let's not compromise this privilege, let's find a solution. Waikawa specifically, personally I've got a very strong connection with it. I love the estuary. It's kayaking, it's where we learn to swim, it's where we learn to play as kids. Now it's difficult to carry a kayak over the bridge, it's even more difficult, as I touched on earlier, to take beach toys, <coughs> deck chairs, where it may be, to set up camp beside the estuary, which is a safe environment for kids. Look, there is, and from the experts that live in that area, um, opportunities to establish beach access further south. <coughs> um, there's enough smarts in this room to to um, come up with a feasible solution. Like entering into a long-term agreement with the landowners um, or to the, and our public access to the beach is possibly going to be some short-term pain for long-term gain. We'd like to encourage that equal access be maintained, be beneficial for the local community in terms of economic development, allows for accessibility and inclusivity. It's revenue generation for the businesses in Manukau. It also creates a possibility to better manage and monitor environmental impacts on the beach ecosystem. So by implementing regulation and guidelines for vehicle access in one designated spot, this can actually help mitigate erosion and we can fence off areas that vehicles aren't allowed and it will protect sensitive habitats and preserve the natural beauty of this area. So look, in closing, this is not just about a few wealthy residents who want to keep this amazing place to themselves. This is a Harfano asset. It should be able to be shared with all the people of Harfano. It's a privilege and it's why we live here. Harfano District Council claim, and I quote, being in the outdoors and going to the beach is a big part of the Harfano lifestyle. There is no very, very difficult to get onto Hokkaido Beach with vehicle access, um, so really you've got Wairuweri or Foxton Beach. If we're going to restrict vehicle access to Waikawa, how does that align with Council's value and vision of embracing the outdoors and sharing Harfano lifestyle? Thank you for your time. Appreciate your time, Stephen. Thank you for presenting to us. Can I welcome Steve Bailey to the table, please? Have we got another Steve Bailey in the, in the room, have we? I'd like to see a welcoming committee. So, here's Jordan's Bailey. Am I okay? Right. You're fine to go, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, my name's Steve Bailey, as you probably already guessed. Uh, I'm a permanent resident at Waikawa Beach. First of all, I'd like to thank HDC and its councillors to and acknowledge the difficult position that council now finds itself in as it tries to navigate what has become a very difficult path towards a solution that will hopefully find an acceptable solution to a unique problem and help unify the community once more. At this point, I wanted to um, play a clip of uh, a soundtrack, which is entitled The Sweet Sound of a Two-Stroke Dirt Bike. You can all guess the irony here, because although I'm, uh, I'm not against vehicle access, I do find the sound of a two-stroke dirt bike from dawn till dusk on a bad day very intrusive. So I'm not going to play that because it'll take up too much time. Uh, I love motorbikes, and I love motorbike racing. I went racing back in the day on circuits like Gracefield, Pororo, and the famous Cemetery Circuit in Wanganui. I've been to Brands Hatch, Silverstone, and many others. I'm now wearing a souvenir from the Czech Republic MotoGP round in Brno in 2019. I loved it intensely. But all of those events were held on closed circuits over one weekend. Noisy, but away from residential areas. Personally, I'm not opposed to vehicle access, as I've said before, but the argument 
Uh, there is absolutely no argument for noisy, disrespectful, intimidating or dangerous vehicles on the beach. Peaceful enjoyment. We've heard a lot from the pro-access lobby about their right to vehicle access on the beach, but I would argue that it is a privilege, not a right. As evidenced by the, poss by the possible withdrawal of the current access due to the irresponsible actions of an entitled few. Remember, there are also a large number of residents and visitors who feel it is their right to experience peaceful enjoyment of the beach without four-wheel drives and quads and dirt bikes doing donuts in front of them while they're exercising their horse, walking their dogs, having a family picnic, going for a swim or just meandering along in, so in solitude. Who can forget last Easter when the beach became a racetrack? There was not one square metre of sand between high and low tide, from the estuary to Wairongamai stream, that hadn't been ridden, driven and donutted on. And it went on all day for three, of three out of the four days. It was a total mess, and as much as I'm sure that the vehicle users enjoyed it immensely, it was far from pleasant for the rest of us. So along with protecting the dunes, the wildlife, the flora, the planting, and to stop erosion and the effort we put into enhancing and beautifying the beach for everyone to enjoy. Perhaps the most important thing to remember is that we need to balance any solution with our right to peaceful enjoyment. Building a racetrack. There is no disputing that, as it stands, Waikawa Beach is a community of two halves, and it is not just pro-access, no-access issue that divides us. It's Strathnaber Drive. Think of it this way. If vehicle access were to eventually be located at either the south or north tracks of Raymakai Grove, the place we live in will, will never have the right to peaceful enjoyment, not only for the beach, but our own, own neighbourhood. Every four-wheel drive, quad bike and dirt bike, either from the community or just visiting, will access the beach by driving, riding the long way around Strathnagra to get to the beach. And once there, they will variously make the most of it. Some will be respectful of walkers, cyclists, dogs, horses, children on the road and the beach, and some most definitely will not. Anyone can see that this carries a huge health and safety risk. And if access is placed on Ray Mackay Grove, our right to peaceful enjoyment will be gone. Once on the beach, dirt bike and riders will, and some quads, uh, will either point north to the estuary and open it up and, or, or they'll head south. I'd also like to, so, so I have to race through this, um, I'd also like to challenge the uh, WBRA survey which found 63% and 37% opposed. Um, and the, the pro-access lobby are obviously very happy with that, simple maths, we won, you lost. But it was really three votes, yes, yes with restrictions and no. It may be that a significant number of the yes voters would withdraw their support if there were no restrictions placed on vehicles and the users. The current rhetoric of the pro-access lobby that they have a majority is most likely not true. Therefore, I formally request WBRA review their respective survey results and categorise them in a more representative way. Yes, no and maybe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. And our last uh, submitter to wishes to speak is Shibong Fahey. Welcome. Kia ora koutou. my name is Shibong Fahey. I wrote the speech very last minute, so please bear with me. Myself and partner and two kids built a holiday home in Waikawa Beach in 2020. We chose Waikawa as we've been coming here over 15 years and loved that we could drive down the beach, go fishing, swimming and load up for the day with the marquee and the cuts. We built a holiday home to enjoy with our whanau, including the ones who cannot walk far in the sand, that being my mum and dad. We haven't been able to do this for months now. Our beautiful brand new holiday house sits abandoned because abandoned, dormant and empty because we have no use for it anymore. The anti-access folk think all of us pro-access are a bunch of meatheads who only want to do donuts on the beach. Well, here's a story for you. On the night of the 23rd of January 2022, we packed our dinner and headed down the beach for an evening fish on the quad with the kids. It was a great night for fishing. We caught eight snapper to feed and share with our family and friends. 
When packing up, the kids found a little sea parent bird on the sand close by. He couldn't fly and needed help. We carefully wrapped him in a blanket and took him back home and took care of him overnight. First thing in the morning was my daughter's eighth birthday. We drove him up to the Vin Vets to meet Massey University, who collected the little fella and were grateful for us keeping alive. If we hadn't have been down there that day, that bird would have lost his life. We are not the monsters they make us out to be. We are simply all the same. We all want to enjoy we all enjoy the wildlife as much as everybody else. There is plenty of room for us all to ensure and enjoy the beach wildlife included. Um, we have no town water supply and only one 25,000 litre community water tank. There's approximately 340 homes in the immediate area. Divide that by 25,000, that's 73 litres of water per household to keep our homes and families safe. I think my chili bin can hold more water than that. Does the oh, and does the council have an updated health and safety plan for the area since we are now down to one exa? Um, our house valuations have dropped and no homes or beaches are selling. Each week I get a not notification on Trade to say our property, our property in Waikawa Beach is being decreased in price. Yet all the houses are flying out the door north and south of Waikawa Beach. Why? Because simply we. Simply, we have no beach access, so the attraction is gone. Over some of the book of batches that empty, the town was barren, and it still is. The community spirit has gone. Waikawa has lost its spark, and we want our beach back. Um, would I be able to please cut my time short so Kurt could continue on with his speech? Could I request that? No, we can't allow that. Sorry. Okay, well, yep. if that's the case, then I'm just going to leave you with this. This is the um, current Waikawa beach calendar that was voted for by the community and put together I think with members of the Waikawa Beach Association and that speaks for itself with the vehicle on it and that was voted for last year and um, thank you for your time and I appreciate the opportunity Thank you for your time, appreciate it So that brings us to the end of all those who wish to uh, present to us uh, we're now going to move to the item itself, and I'm going to shortly ask um, um, Brent Harvey, who's the general manager who wrote the report, um, to come forward. But first of all, I do have to uh, initially uh, follow due process, and because these were late items, um, we need to, and I can't read that, Jason, <laughs> We need to uh, move the fact that we will uh, accept the late items on the agenda. Uh, so, um, uh, no, it's okay. Um, that items number 7.3, 7.5 in relation to Waikawa Beach Vehicle Access Way uh, and the water. Oh, the next one down. Okay. Uh, be considered as a late item due to the report not being available at the time the agenda was prepared as discussions were ongoing with related parties and this item cannot wait to a subsequent meeting because the community have submitted on this matter and we're expecting to speak to these submissions in 7.4 in relation to regional collaboration on a water services delivery plan be considered as a late item as the information was not available at the time of the agenda the agenda was prepared and this matter cannot wait until a later meeting as council may need to appoint a representative to the advisory oversight group which will meet before the next meeting of council so moved seconded by councillor Tommy Ha. all those in favour against carried thank you so could I invite um, Brent to the table please being joined by Stefan and Lacey as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, good afternoon, councillors, staff, and uh, members of the public. In introducing the Waikawa Beach Access Way Report, I'd like to not only acknowledge those that have presented here today, but also to the 446 submitters that have taken the time and effort to submit on this important, important topic. This is a complex issue, and one that's invoked an extremely high level of community interest. Today, Council is faced with a challenging decision, one that feels like there are no winners, and no matter what the outcome, there will be disappointment experienced within the community. From an officer point of view, 
it has also been challenging. And I'd like to take a moment to thank those have been, that have been involved from our team for their efforts over the past few months. It's been intensive. We've felt the emotion and passion in hearing different views and perspectives from the many different factions within the community. Council does not own the land necessary to facilitate access for either option one or option two. Our, consulta our consultation with the community was conducted in good faith with the view of securing agreement across private land, which is essential, essential for these options. Prior to the release of the council agenda, it became apparent that options one and two are no, no longer feasible for a number of reasons, and that the landowners wish to pursue their own aspirations in respect to their land, and that is unlikely to be an arrangement with council. Staff have been collaborating closely with the landowners and will continue to do, working with them to uphold their rights over their whenua, ensuring that our efforts align with and support their aspirations. I also would like to take the opportunity to publicly thank them for their generosity over the last 30 plus year, years in providing this service to the community. As per the appendum to this report that was issued by the Chief Executive this morning, the advice received is that the best course of action is to formally receive and hear the submissions. The hearing of submissions is the anticipated and natural conclusion to this part of the process, despite information having changed at the close of submissions. The advice is that given options one, or two, one and two are not reasonably practicable at this point, Council could decide to adopt option three. In any case, after having heard from submitters, noting that this option is set out in the Council Report, section 3.3. .3. However, Given the change in circumstances, particularly given the short notice that both elected members and submitters have had to understand the impacts on options one or two no longer being viable, it's recommended that Council consider the following recommendations. That Council note options one or two as they were one and two as they were consulted are not viable options at this time. That Council lay this matter on the table and consider an, op an option three at its next council meeting, which will allow further analysis and advice on the impacts of not only consider, considering one option, oh sorry, of now only considering one option, or that council, after hearing submissions on options one, two, and three, and given the general level of support for the provision of a vehicle access way, that council pauses the current process and re requests the chief executive to report back to council on alternative options to provide an access way at Waikawa Beach. Council, you've heard directly from a number of submitters this afternoon, and there are a number of factors to take into account in deciding the next steps. Thank you for your opportunity to for the opportunity to introduce this report, and I'll now hand over to you for any questions. Thank you, Brent. Any questions for Brent? Sorry, Council Jennings, can you hear me okay? You've got your hand up? Yeah, I've got my hand up. But I think Rogan's first. Oh, well, I thought you were. I, I don't mind, I'll take it. Um, I just wanted a quick question, probably to you, Stefan, about the existing footbridge, the pedestrian access footbridge, and the state of that and our renewal plan for that, just as some background information. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Councillor Boyle, through your worship. Um, the existing footbridge um, is near the end of its life. Um, the last report that we have indicated that it has approximately two years before it's due for renewal. The current budget we have won't go uh, far enough to replace that bridge, so it would be um, a decision that comes back to Council as to if, if we can fund that or not. Did you still have a question, Councillor Jennings? Yes, please. There you go. Yeah, um, team, in the original report that's in the agenda, uh, under the climate change section, it obviously references some high-level um, commentary around climate change effects. Um, but we obviously also heard from submitters today and, and in the submissions around um, that uh, if no access was provided, that there would be, there, there are, access points north and south of the Waikawa Beach community. Um, have we done any analysis of what the 
uh, emissions uh, increase or impact would be if, if vehicles, um, the current level of activity uh, did have to or wanted to use uh, those north or south uh, access points. Thank you, Councillor Jennings. Um, and through you, Worship, no, we haven't done any um, any calculations or further analysis on on the emissions of, of those access points. Thank you. Councillor Proctor. I think I have a question on process. I'm just trying to formulate it. Considering our process now is essentially flawed, uh, and then we made a decision at future council meetings, say the next council meeting, about an option that was part of a flawed process, what legal comeback would the community have on us? Uh, through you, Your Worship, um, for absolute clarity, this process is not flawed. Uh, uh, as per communication to elected members over the last uh, 76 hours, and as we've communicated to the public, uh, we have sought additional legal advice. Uh, that is why we've taken the time to ensure that we are hearing submissions, uh, as you have just done today. Uh, the legal advice is consistent with the advice I've been consistent in providing elected members. The hearing of submissions is the most natural way for us to conclude this part of the process. Council would be within its rights to make a decision on option three today. However, given the circumstances and situation we find ourselves in, uh, that is why we have uh, issued the appendum with those additional recommendations. Uh, but certainly I have no procedural concerns um, and uh, would encourage you, Councillor Proctor, to not be concerned about any procedural um, matters. Apologies, I take back the flawed comment. Councillor Tommy Hunt. Um, Kira guys, thank you for the report. Um, I suppose, um, well, first and foremost, I want to acknowledge um, those that have turned up today and provided their um, submissions and the passion and the commitment to the community is very loud and clear. Um, also, I really want to acknowledge um, the whānau that have given our community the access out there for such a long period of time. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting scenario we, we find ourselves in and I do wonder, given some of the submissions we've received and even the proposal that's been offered, if there's any other solutions that have been offered around um, that proposal um, that, the, that the community have brought forward. Has, have, has there been any other exploration of ideas um, other than what's written in that proposal? Because I'm interested to know uh, if there are other ideas out there. Thank you, Councillor Tamihana. The only um, additional options that we've we've got on the table at present were what we um, spoke around at the previous um, council meeting in December when we chose to go out with options one, two, or three in this report. Um, we don't have any other options on the table um, at this point. Um, yeah. Uh, through you, Your Worship. Um just, just to be specific, that's not us saying there may not be alternative options. Um, th there is very likely to be alternative options, but as officers, we've not had the mandate to go and explore other options. Our commitment, um, as per the direction from this council table, was to follow through the community consultation process on options one, two and three. Uh, and now that options one and two are not viable, we're seeking direction from council on whether you would like us to go and consider some alternative options. Um, you know, we, we've obviously heard through the submissions, um, there are some indications from members of the community who would like to be part of trying to find some of those alternative solutions, but they've not been in the scope of this particular consultation process. Just another question. Um, so, in relation to those comments, if I look at the way that 2.5 is written in the addendum, uh, where it says further analysis and advice on the impacts, well, that, so that further analysis and advice on impacts will only relate to option three and no other potential options or exploration of potential options. Uh, through you, Your Worship. Correct, Councillor Proctor. So 2.5 should be read as a or 2.6. Um, so ultimately uh, what councillors would be deciding is whether at your next meeting uh, you want a specific report um, where you debate option three and option three alone. 
uh, or whether you want us to put our energy into finding alternative options uh, to bring that analysis piece back to council before you make that debate and decision. Um, I'm interested in understanding whether there's any existing um, budget um, around renewals that specifically would improve the pedestrian access at Waikawa currently, and if there has been any investigation as to costs to restoring improved access at Waikawa. Uh, through you, Your Worship, the, there is, um, we have some budget available in terms of the, the pedestrian access, and you would have heard from some submitters today and in the submissions that there is work to do to um, restore those pedestrian accesses to what they were, given the damage that has occurred, the removal of bollards, the planting, etc. So we, we have got some rough water costs in order to achieve that. Um, but yeah, this, that's where that is at present. Would, would that budget be sufficient or would additional budget be required through the long-term planning process to actually enhance that access more to, in thinking from an, an access for those that are disabled? And also, given the report, the, not report, but the email we received from Kurt Renner around the um, 650 metres and the disability aids that we'd received. Through your worship, I think we, we could look to make some improvements to those um, access ways to try and achieve some of those outcomes. Um, it would take a little bit, we would need to do some further investigation as to how far we could take that with the budget available. And just for clarification, um, a number of the points that have been raised today uh, um, affect the emergency response vehicles. So, can you confirm to me if there was an incident right now? How would emergency services access somebody at Waikawa Beach? Through your worship, they would have to access via an alternate beach access, either north or south of the beach, or via helicopter or by the yeah, by the means. And given the location of those ambulance stations, what would be the average transit time from the stations based locally? Just in your best guess estimate. So you're talking from Duncan Street in Ōtaki? Yeah, I don't don't think um, our manager would be able to answer uh, realistically uh, a timeline of that because that can alter according to the fine. Yeah. So I can just raise one point. Um, Stefan's quite rightly pointed out to me is in terms of the improvement of the pedestrian access, if we're looking at some work there, we would likely require some consent. Uh, there would like to be a consent required for that also. Councillor Jennings. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just one clarification, please, from the Chief Executive or the team, um, that if a councillor wanted to move 2.6, um, which is around looking at alternative options, um, does that, presumably that includes both new options, but also potentially reopens the door to bringing back some of the options that were previously uh, disregarded or, or, or um, dispensed with prior to the uh, consultation process commencing. Can you just comment on that? Uh, through your worship, yes, that's correct, Council Jennings. So it would be, it would consider both um, new options, but would also consider the basis of those options that had been considered. But I think um, just from a procedural point of view, it's worth pointing out that councillors didn't rule out those options full stop. I, for example, we're not looking at um, needing to use our revocation requirements understanding orders if you were to reintroduce some of those options. It was more that you did not choose for those options to go through to the, community, through to the consultation process. Thank you, that's very clear. Cheers. Another question, Council Proc. <laughs> uh, just following up on Councillor Jennings' comments there, um, I just want to this is for clarification for me, personally. Um, 2.6 doesn't actually exclude option 3 in the future, does it? It's still that's, That option still remains, doesn't it? Uh, 
through your worship, uh, yes, that's correct. Um, and it would be important that option three remained as, a, um, as an option that you considered alongside those alternative options. Uh, uh, point of order. Councillor Jennings. Yeah, sorry, I just need, well, sorry, it's probably a point of clarification. I just need real clarity on that point because the wording is very clear in 2.6 where it says to report back to council on alternative options to provide vehicle access way at Waikawa Beach. So if I was going to move 2.6, as I would like to, um, I'm clear that essentially council is making a decision that it believes and is supporting retaining vehicle access and that the exercise that 2.6 envisages is to go away and consider the op options to facilitate that. So I, I, I understood that uh, option three wouldn't be in the mix in terms of 2.6. I understood it the other way, Councillor Jennings. So we'll just get this chief executive to respond. Uh, in preparing the recommendation, um, wrongly or rightly, Councillor Jennings, we had assumed that it would include option three in the mix when we brought the report back to Council. Um, and it may be that where the table lands on this, um, would you may want to be express whether that includes option three or not. The Probably the advice I would offer to the table is that Options one and two are not viable. Uh, option three is currently a viable option. When we bring alternative options back to the table on on the um, the vehicle access way, um, given the high public interest um, and kind of as per the same advice I'd provided to you previously around the triggering of significance and therefore a decision under our significance and engagement policy, the test is about the all practicable options, right? And so option three still remains a practicable option for council alongside those alternative options. So I apologise if the analysis is not clear on that, and it may be that we need further advice on that. Um, so... Can I just clarify, follow up with a further clarification? Sorry, because I just want to be really precise about this. So how then do councillors sitting around this table define the options that we want you to go away and explore if, if 2.6 um, is successful? Because um, the scope of what's on the table or not on the table, um, given obviously that there's some other things where people are proposing different options with different funding and, and different budgets. Um, so, yeah, can you just talk me through that? So that if 2.6 uh, is moved and is successful, um, and you're saying that at a minimum option three is in the mix, how else um, are, you, are we proposing to include what is in the mix, or does that come later? I'm not sure I, answer the, I understand the question, um, Councillor Jennings. Okay. So at the, at the moment, so so we're going to ask you to go away, potentially, if 2.6 is moved and successful, we're going to go away, ask you to go away and look at alternative options. Um, at what point do councillors get to uh, put into the mix what some of those other options might be? Because you're saying that at a minimum, option three is one of the options that's included. So the, um, the thinking was that we would go, if council were to give us direction that you want us to consider alternative options, that we would go back to that original report that was prepared and presented to council end of last year. Um, but in addition to that, um, we, uh, we wouldn't, um, we d wouldn't intend on utilising external consultants for this work. We would intend to do it internally and we've already had some conversations in house around how we'd crack capacity for that um, to consider what other options may be available that had not been considered at that point in time and so they may need to explore options like for example land acquisition it may need to explore uh, as has been mentioned kind of in the line of questioning from councillor grimstone uh, the relationship between the vehicle access way versus the pedestrian access way um, 
the intent would be to bring back a kind of a desktop analysis of those options in order for councillors to ideally narrow down those options, which would um, then result in a further conversation with the community. The yep. so, so we don't need to proactively today um, include, for example, including options uh, involving potential land acquisition, etc. like that. We don't need to specifically put those things onto the table because you already, through, you would do those, yeah, yeah, if, those if the motion was successful. Through you, Your Worship, uh, essentially what you're doing today is giving us permission to go away and explore some alternative options, allowing us to bring it back to the table that aren't option one or two, but provide for the potential vehicle access way on the beach. Um, that, but, yeah, that's clear. Thank you. At, at that point in time, Councillor Jennings, uh, councillors may decide to rule option three out, uh, but I would prefer that I have um, taken advice prior to me giving you that advice that it would be safe to rule out option three now, because I really do think that when we think about that test of all reasonable, op practicable options, you need to consider option three against whatever other options you may consider Four, five, six, ABC. Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks. Councillor Boyle, uh, two more questions. One just following up after Clint's query about budget for, you know, if, if there was some goal to establish a first class walkway of pedestrian access. We have 238k in the LTP budget for Waikawa Beach pedestrian access this year. Do we have a renewals budget for the footbridge, or is the capex value of three fifty k for the footbridge? Yeah. Do we have any money set aside? Would it be illogical to make a resolution about some kind of first class walkway being established without there being any actual budget to do so? Yeah, I think uh, through you, Worship. Thank you, Council Boyle. Um, I believe um, the the money in relation to the footbridge has been deferred um, and, um, to a later year, um, and we're currently working through through that process at, at present. Um, we do have some money, I believe, in our capital budgets for the walkway. Um, oh, sorry, Stefan's informed me that's also been deferred, so um, that's a later point. So not right now, other than the renewal budget. Um, and my other question was related to climate change and the, so the only kind of mapping we have of that area from the data from the UN panel on climate change since by 2030, all of the potential access way sites would be um, covered by tidal zone. Have you got any comment on if we should build an access way in a place that might in six years be where the tide's sitting? It's an accreting beach. Surely this data is just wrong, but it's the only data that we've got. Um, no, I don't have any comment at this point. We we'll need to. Um, yeah. um, Chief Executive just wants to make a, put some context around the deferred capital expenditure. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So, just to remind Council that um, we're obviously embarking on this capital prioritisation journey given the $40 million cap we are putting on current year in future years um, due to the proposed rates increase and our debt threshold limits. And so just to give councillors reassurance that that capital prioritisation process comes back to this table for you to decide. Those are some internal guidance conversations that are taking place. And so, yes, stuff's been deferred in terms of the process we're going through, but we know it comes back to this table and ultimately you're the decision makers around that. Thank you. Any further questions? Not, yes. a, not a question, maybe any better. Well, probably, probably more an amendment to 2.6. Well, let's finish the questions first and then uh, follow up with um, that. Okay. Thank you, team. Councillor Jennings, you've got your hand up. Are you wishing to move a recommendation? Yeah, I'd like to move 2.6. Uh, do you want me to read it out? Uh, I will. 
Have we not done two book talks? I thought we did that initially. No, we didn't. Oh, okay. Um, I've just been advised that I need to move um, 2.4 first uh, before we get to 2.6. So I'll move that Council note that options 1 and 2 as they were consulted on, are not viable options at this time. I have a second from Councillor Tamiha. Any further discussion on that? All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. All right, so 2.6 being moved by Councillor Jennings is that after hearing submissions on options 1, 2 and 3, and given the general level of support for the provision of a vehicle access way that council pauses the current process and requests the chief executive to report back to council on alternative options to provide vehicle access way at Waikawa Beach. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Olson, thank you. So the recommendations on the table. Do you wish to speak to that, Councillor Jens? Yeah, look, I'll, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll speak very briefly to it um, to say, look, um, oh, I think that the consultation process uh, that we've been under that we've been through has indicated a pretty clear steer from uh, both the local community as well as the wider community that um, vehicle access um, is important and and should be uh, prioritized and retained um, and I guess one of the things that um, I've taken away from the consultation process is that some of the no vehicle access submissions really conflate um, no access with meaning no vehicles on the beach, which we know is is not um, is not the decision uh, up for um, decision making today. Um, it, it's it purely is about um, access, and it, in my thinking that um, if you do uh, remove access or you don't provide access at Waikawa, I think that it actually would likely. Well, there's a there's a likelihood that actually some of the things that that uh, some of those submissions speak to at the moment around uh, antisocial behaviour and and unauthorised access onto the beach uh, by not providing access, uh, we're likely to see those behaviours simply continue. Um, so, uh, I would have thought that access a a filmed uh, access way uh, that is um, appropriately located and takes into uh, account all of those environmental considerations is is obviously uh, the most sensible uh, way to move forward. Um, I think it's um, also pretty important uh, to reflect on, on those comments of some of those submissions uh, that talked about um, the, the access to the north and the south at Otaki and, and, and Kuku, um, that those people will still, uh, if, if no access is, 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 is um, uh, the decision, then um, people will still travel to those points to access the beach. Uh, and that, that just has the effect of increasing emissions. And I mean, I've been listening to this table talk about climate change and, and talking about emissions. And so, and you know, this is a clear example where uh, this will uh, inc increase uh, vehicle distance, time, cost, uh, and, and emissions. So uh, there's some, hopefully there's some consistency uh, around the table in terms of that. Um, and look, um, I've reflected on some particular um, submissions and I, I wanted to particularly uh, reference Mr Nolder's um, submission uh, because I think he put it um, perfectly around what actually uh, option three means. Um, and so it doesn't mean no vehicles on the beach. And I think it's really important that, um, as I say, we listen to the community who have said uh, they do want um, uh, access uh, onto the beach at, at Waikawa Beach, and so therefore I think 2.6 is the only sensible option for us at this point to consider uh, what there, what appears to be a range of uh, other uh, options um, that, that need some further work, further thinking. Uh, we've got very generous people in our community uh, who want to make things work, who are willing to put their money where their mouths are um, to um, get something uh, over the line. So. Uh, I urge councillors to listen to the community and back 2.6. Councillor Olson, do you wish to speak? Oh, I think Sam's probably summed things up pretty well for me, um, but on a personal note, I guess the emergency aspect and, and disabled um, people in our community having access to the beach is probably quite important for me. Um, I guess at the end of the day, we're going to 
go away and do a bit more work on this. Um, it's not ruling out option three um, as an end result, but I think um, we, we need to, we, we owe it to ourselves and the community to at least um, at least explore this thing further. Deputy Mayor, um, look, I have a I have a concern with the result with the recommendation. Well, now it's on the table as worded, and I come back to the initial observation made by Councillor Jennings about where those people who support option three, where they can find in that resolution a guarantee that that their no vehicle option remains alive when it comes to analysis and reporting back uh, to the council. Um, at the moment, it's silent in terms of option three. Regardless of some assurances given that option three will come through as an idea, the resolution as it stands, I think, is cold comfort to those people who want their voices to be heard in the subsequent debate. And so I would like to <coughs> test the mood by moving um, an amendment that after the words Waikawa Beach at the end of the current um, recommendation, that, that we add the words along with the option of not permitting vehicle access. And, and, and if there's a second to that, I, I think I've expressed my reasons for it. It's about inclusion and people feeling that, that this report will be fulsome in terms of all the options. So I've now spoken to it without a second. So there you go. I say, so Councillor Grimstone, you're indicating support of that, I'm seconding that. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so we now have an amendment on the table. Um, and and to be fair to you, Mr Mayor, I have spoken to it in terms of my reasons. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Councillor Grimstein, do you wish to add anything to is the seconder? No. Okay. So the amendment now is the uh, main uh, resolution. Um, does anyone wish to speak to that? Councillor Tamihana. Uh, I don't have an issue with the amendment as such, but I actually have a, a, a further amendment I'd like to have considered to the to the wording. Um, so can I raise that now, or do you need to do this first? <laughs> we need to dis uh, deal with this amendment first. Uh, all right. Okay, so there's no further debate or discussion, I'll put the motion I'll call for a division please certainly, division called for and accepted sorry, did you wish to speak to the motion? Can, can, can you clarify that we are merely voting on the yes. motion and not the motion itself. No, we're, we're voting on the amendment. Okay. So, Deputy Mayor Allen, we should start. In favour. Councillor Olsen? Yes, in favour. Councillor Tamihana? Aye. Councillor, sorry, Barker? <coughs> yeah. Councillor Boyle? Support. Councillor Horridge Park? For. Councillor Proctor? Yes. Councillor Young? Yes. Councillor Grimstone? Aye. Councillor Tukapua? Four. And I am also for. So the motion is. Uh, oh, Councillor Jennings. Apologies. Yeah, that's fine. I'll go for. Thank you. So that motion is passed. So, Councillor Tamihana, you had another resolution you wanted to propose? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I have a um, level of uncomfort with the last part of the wording. It almost signifies to me that Council will provide the alternative um, vehicle access, and so I want the word potential um, put in front of alternative. Um, it's, it's not a fait accompli for me. It's um, options to be considered by this table. Sorry, does that now read that Council pauses the current process and requests the Chief Executive to report back to Council on potential options rather than alternative? 
Okay. Oh, so changing the Yeah. Okay. Is there a second of that? Uh, what we've already passed the resolution, so we can't do. To me, it achieves the same thing, but does the CE have any advice around the use of one word over the other? My advice to his worship was that I think the intent of adding the word alternative achieves the same thing as the resolution you've just passed. Potential use. Yes. So I think what Councillor Tommy Hunter is looking for is assurances that in passing the resolution, we're not saying that we are providing the equal access way. And my advice is that the resolution you've just passed, which uh, uh, the amendment that you've just passed, which um, means that you've been expressed, you've expressly said that option three is still on the table. That means that not providing vehicle access is still an option, so it, it achieves the same thing. Um, but there is no harm in adding the word alternative uh, potential. Um, just from a, I suppose, policy perspective, there would be no need, is my advice. So I've got a mover, but no seconder. Okay. Sorry, you need to. Uh, yeah, I'll second that. You second that? Okay. So it's been seconded by Council Grimstone. Do you wish to speak to that? No? Okay. No, don't need the question either. Okay, so um, I'll just get Grayson to maybe read that so everybody is aware of the wording that is being proposed. So the amendment is that after the words Chief Executive to report back on, uh, that we add to the word potential. So it now reads the Chief Executive to report to Council on potential alternative options uh, to provide vehicle access way at Waikama Beach. Um, that would then be added with the amendment along with the option of not permitting vehicle access. So that's how it would read all, all together. Thank you, Grayson. Um, any further discussion? around that. Okay, so I'll put that resolution all those in favour. Just raise your hands please so I can see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right. So the resolution is passed. Right. So that brings us to the end of uh, this topic. Um, can I just think, no, sorry, where am I going? We still have a substantive motion on the table, sorry. Okay, so we've um, moved the amendment and we've moved the second amendment. Um, so uh, we're now going back to 2.6, which was the original amendment, uh, original resolution. Um, so, Councillor Jennings, do you wish to add anything to that uh, proposal? No, look, I think I've... Um, I've Spoken um, to the to the motion sufficiently. Thank you. Okay, Councillor yes, Proctor. Oh, I'd like to add a bit to the to the discussion. Um, it's disappointing to see that our best laid plans went uh, awry, and uh, I think it's important that we do spend a bit more time to get this right. And uh, more importantly, I think we need to spend a bit more time to ensure we uh, develop a bit more social cohesion or community cohesion in Waikara as well through a little bit extra time and finding alternatives and exploring solutions. Thank you. Okay, so, well, Councillor Boyle. Yeah, I'd love to speak on this one. Um, and I'm going to speak somewhat at odds with the majority of the community, but I'm pretty happy to stand on the, um, the left side of the community for this one. I don't sit at this table to get re-elected. I do it because I <laughs> took, took an oath to make right logical decisions. Um, our local iwi for this area said that they generally don't support vehicle access on the beach. They're our partners. We should listen to them. They also don't support river training. We had some pretty powerful submissions, like, like yours most, Jan. You're number one for me today. Um, I think delaying this decision longer 
it's just dragging out the inevitable. And I, in the, we should probably make the decision now just not to do it and enable those groups with significant funds that want to explore alternate routes of establishing private access to do so. I'd encourage them to. I'd far prefer we spend the significant money that we're going to end up spending delaying this and going out. And, yeah, we, we're going to waste a lot of money on this and probably get nowhere. Um, we should spend that money on establishing a first-class pedestrian access, and we should do that sooner than later. Um, time's changing. We can't continue to abuse the environment for our own selfish benefits. Nature has pretty clearly told us what it wants in Waikawa, and it doesn't want that way access there. I'd also like to think that given the discussions we've had about beach bylaws and how we've seen around the country the changes in beach bylaws around vehicle access, that it'd be really foolish to invest in creating something that only a couple of years from now, the subsequent council is very likely to pass a bylaw that makes completely unusable. I won't indulge Councillor Jennings on his facetious climate emissions concerns, but I do wish to really thank him that he's having concerns about climate change at all now. <laughs> that's, that's a win for all of us. Um, that, that's my bit. I'm, I'm pretty happy that this is going to go not the way I'd like it to. But. Um, and just remind you, Councillor Boyle, this decision is still to be made, so your, your opinions and views will be then considered at the time that we actually debate the issue. So, um, yeah, don't think that you're wasting your um, speech at the moment. And I'm sure Councillor Jennings will, uh, will have heard you speak about um, your views on his views on climate change. Thank you. Um, all right, so can I just then uh, put the motion all those in favour? So, what... I'm just, this is 2.6 we're talking about. No, we've already done the amendment. This is going back to the original motion. And I... Yeah, yeah. I'm so stuck. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just needed to um, make sure we got the process correct. Councillor <laughs> do you wish to speak? She would. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chief Executive. Well, can, can you please clarify where we're at with this motion? I would be happy to, Your Worship. Uh, so just for absolute clarity, you have passed two amendments that... Um, now add up to the substantive motion that is in front of you and so you you now are voting on the substantive motion that reads as is in front of you except it adds the word potential in front of alternative and then instead of the full stop finishing it now makes it clear that it would also include option three 
Yes, yeah. We're all on the same page. So, um, Councillor Tukapur, do you wish to move there? It's already moved. So, can I just confirm with the people that originally moved it then that they're comfortable with those additions? Yeah. They have no choice? Okay. We've posted the amendments. Thank you. Councillor Tukapur. Yeah, just before we do the final vote, um, I'm, I'm going to say that I will be supporting it. Uh, I really like your um, points, though, Rogan. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking towards the prioritising of the capital programme, um, I guess, in sync with all of us. I, I, what's really important, I think, is... Um, is Council of Proctor said harmony in the community. I think restoring um, that out there is um, important and that no one should be feeling um, intimidated. And I, I'm looking for the most inclusive option and something that causes the least harm. I want to thank the um, whānau who have provided free access for over 30 years. Um, standout submissions today for me were a mix of yes and no's. Um, that was Brian, Ewan, Jan, Donna and Steve, was it? Um, but I imagine this is not an isolated situation in New Zealand and that there have been other beach communities that have, have experienced a similar challenge should we access or no access for vehicles so I'm quite interested to know and asking of the Chief Executive um, what kinds of resolutions or tangible results were achieved in those communities around New Zealand that have faced this um, was it a first class pedestrian access um, you know so what what's out there that's being done and how much did that cost I'm interested in that analysis but yeah I've, yeah, we, I'm not determined in my thinking. I just would like to know um, more. Um, but yeah, at the end, yeah, I, I think this is the best way forward for now. And yeah, all the best for um, the people out there. Kia ora. Kia yeah, kia ora. I, um, I do wanted to resonate with the words that have been spoken around the table. Um, I am a um, local boy, has grew up out there as well, spent a lot of time fishing, um, white baiting as a young boy, and gathering hay for local contractors, uh, fundraising for our local college here at Horofanoa. <coughs> um, I understand the diverse situation we find ourselves in. Um, you know, we have very few pristine areas on this coast that we can consider our pristine. We only have one protected area, which is called the Ramsar site at Foxton, and this is probably the second most sensitive area we have in the district. And while this council grapple with how we manage multiple use and users in our coastal spaces, um, this is just one example of the type of difficult decisions that council are forced to make, weighing up the, the benefits of people against the benefit of our environment and obviously for council, the benefit of cost will not. Um, so this is a really huge, complex situation. Um, I'm an advocate, obviously, I'm a fisherman. Um, I know that we have species out there that are depleted. Tohiro is one of my passions, um, and I would love to have it restored. Um, we don't have the tools as a district or as a nation to create unique, safe places that we can revitalise and enhance what we've lost and what we've got. And so I think that there's a huge consideration here of how we balance up, how everyone um, can walk away with their mana intact. I love um, John's harmonisation of our community. It's really sad to hear that Waikawa has um, a split in their, in their community. I am a moko of Waikawa. I come from Wehiwehi Marae as well as others and so be brave i want to help find a solution um, i would hate to see my own whanau cut off from an ability to to take kai home to their people and and that's for everyone not just my whanau but everyone so 
yeah, I just want to acknowledge each and every one of you and the effort and the energy you've given and what you've shared with us. So, kia ora. Just a brief comment, although there has been some very clear positions taken by a couple of councillors today for or against vehicle access, the point of today's motion is about no predetermination, keeping an open mind because all options are yet to be explored. And I think my final words on this to the Waikoua community is this issue is alive. No decisions have been made and they have not been made for very sound reasons. Uh, the delay is necessary, but we need to get it right. And I think all, all councillors, and I think councillors took a pearl for her words on the subject, all of us need to just be ready to sit back consider the subsequent evidence and analysis which will come from officers before we make a final stance on the issue. Thank you. Okay, so um, did I hear a division being called for before for this uh, topic as well? Yes. Right, um, Deputy Mayor Allen. In favour? Councillor Olsen. Four. Councillor Tommy Hanna. Aye. Councillor Barker. Yes. Councillor Boyle. Against. Councillor Horridge Park. Four. Councillor Proctor. Four. Councillor Young. Four. Councillor Grimstone. Aye. Councillor Tukapua. Aye. And I will vote for uh, Councillor Jennings, sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Right, the motion's carried. Thank you. Um, in closing this item out, can I just acknowledge you all here today? Um, thank you for being having the passion and commitment to uh, represent your community and your views. Um, and look, we know how difficult this uh, topic is, and uh, there's many uh, complex parts to it. Um, but I just want to acknowledge the respectful way that you delivered your views and opinions today. I thank you for that. Um, and look, we know that this topic is still ongoing. Uh, as with most complex topics these days, they do take time. We want to ensure that we do get it right. Rest assured that elected members will consider uh, very thoroughly uh, your view, all views and opinions. But as you can tell, we can't be predetermined in the way that we do that until we actually get the um, proper reports and all the background information that we need to be able to do that. So also just acknowledging the whānau out there um, at uh, Waikawa, um, appreciate your uh, ongoing uh, engagement with Council and uh, we look forward uh, to continuing that with you all uh, in the near future. So thank you very much. You're welcome, of course, to stay for the rest of the meeting, uh, but I suspect that we'll probably see no seats being uh, um, uh, <laughs> filled up, but uh, thank you. Can we have a toilet break? Or? Um, yeah, so we will adjourn the meeting for five minutes only, all right?
Welcome back, everyone. Um, we'll just resume our meeting with our other late item, which is 7.4, uh, the Regional Collaboration on Water Services Delivery Plan. Um, and the Chief Executive is going to uh, introduce this report to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. Uh, I'll largely take this report as read. Um, the intent of the report is to provide a public update on the uh, local water done well, uh, the new legislative pathway of the government uh, and what it means for council. It's also to provide an update on the work that we're progressing in the Manawatu to Wanganui region, uh, but also to seek your formal endorsement uh, of a process in the Wellington region. Uh, so in terms of the actual decisions I'm seeking, they relate to uh, whether we sign the MOU um, to begin the development of the Water Services Delivery Plan with the Wellington region. Probably the bit that I want to emphasise is that both um, projects, being the Manawatu Wanganui Feasibility Study and the Wellington Water Services Delivery Plan process, um, will present options for council to um, enter the exit ramp. Uh, but what both projects intend to do is to ensure that as elected members you have all reasonably practicable options in front of you uh, and can consider a pathway forward around how we're going to meet our legislative responsibilities. I'm happy to answer any quest questions. Any questions? You're poised. Is someone? Oh, just no one's going to ask. I was going to ask because I read the report, but um, I just couldn't understand what the cost was once we signed up to the MOU. I suppose if there was a cost for us to participate, that's what I was. Yeah, kia ora. Uh, through your worship, there will, there will be a cost. Um, eventually in terms of the work to be progressed. We don't know those costs to date, uh, hence why in the report I signal that we would look to bring that, um, that back to council um, as soon as we did know in order for you to prioritise how we were going to fund that work. Um, the bit that is worth pointing out is, uh, I think I mentioned it in the report and apologies if I didn't, um, that yeah, obviously I did page 353. Obviously, we have no remaining three waters reform transition funding, and the government aren't providing us any further funding. Uh, however, um, uh, have discussed this with Department of Internal Affairs, and they would be open to us relocating, reallocating um, three waters better off funding. Um, so, for example, and a project I can think of that we've not progressed on is the rural water. Um, project and so that might be an option where once we know the costs we can bring that back to council and you could look to reallocate that funding so that we can um, ensure that we are contributing our fair share to these processes. Um, the, the other bit of cost is in staff time uh, obviously in engaging in these conversations uh, but the intent would be that come June you have the feasibility study for the Manawatu Wanganui region we have the early impacts analysis and um, shaping document for the Wellington region and then you've got the data sets, you've got the pros and cons and uh, this council makes a strategic decision on um, where we pursue our energy. Council Proctor. So at this stage we're not actually picking one or the other, we're just staying abreast of both processes and participating in both. Definitely keeping our options open. Okay, um, so let's just move 2.1, 2.2, uh, let the uh, report be received, recognise it's not significant. Can I second it by Deputy Mayor Allen, all those in favour? Against carried. Okay, so we then have... Um, Recommendation 2.3, the Council notes that we're progressing on the Manawatu Wanganui CCO project feasibility. Uh, let's just do these separately, I think. Um, moved by Deputy Mayor Allen, seconded by Councillor Boyle. Any discussion or debate on that? Councillor Boyle, I'm just going to 
moves the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Now move to 2.4. The Council approves signing of a memorandum of understanding to jointly develop a water service delivery plan with the other councils in the Wellington region. Um, moved by Deputy Mayor Allen again, seconded by Councillor Grimstone. Any further discussion? Councillor Tamiya. Yeah, thank you. We wondered, um, I probably just wondered whether it was worth that we inserting the conversation that we just had, that we're relating signing the MOU to potentially better off funding. I'm just trying to cover that we, that we have a resource there for it, or is it not appropriate yet? The intent was to bring back a report to council that would talk about, and here's the costs. So it's not going to cost us just to sign the MOU. What costs is the money, is the, I suppose, the processes. And so hypothetically, let's say at the next council meeting, I bring you a report and it says it costs this much amount of money and council says we don't have that money, we're out. We won't have, we won't have spent any money. So I'll make sure that no funding decisions are made until we any funding of ours is, is called on um, because that gives us time to actually understand what the cost is and come up with those options for you around well what could we debt fund uh, what could we reallocate or reprioritize in the business because you know as per council took a message last week it's top 10 priority um, but also to seek guidance from DIA about the process if we were to reallocate any of our better off funding to this process. Councillor Proctor. Oh, we're allowed to ask questions about the MOU at this stage, or is that? I just want to make sure that the MOU doesn't preclude us from going to DIA as a council alone. There is some commentary in the MOU about project team and secretariat, roles, responsibilities and memberships where that group will go to the DIA as well. Yeah, they'll, I will have no hesitation in going directly to Department of Internal Affairs on things and um, yeah, I don't think that's the intent of the MOU. I think it's more, um, they're just trying to streamline some of that more in analytical technical interface, um, which I don't approach them on. Put the recommendation all those in favour. Against. Carried. Thank you. Uh, 2.5. The Council agrees to delegate authority to the Chief Executive to finalise the Memorandum of Understanding consistent with discussions and any amendments made by the Committee. Moved by Councillor Boyle, seconded by Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Allen. Any further discussion? Put that recommendation. All those in favour? Against carried and 2.6 in terms of nominating uh, to be who to be the council representative of the oversight group. Um, would you like to? Um, oh, no, maybe we, you don't because I'm not. Mr. Yes, sorry, Mr. Uh, Councillor Jennings. Yeah, look, I, I think that I was going to move 2.6 to say that the council agrees to nominate yourself to be the council's representative on the advisory oversight group for the joint water service delivery plan process in the Wellington region with councillor Tukapura being an alternative, the nominated alternative. Thank you. Um, seconded by councillor Olsen. Just ensure, um, just making sure that councillor Tukapura is happy to accept that um, nomination. Yeah, uh, I obviously said it was my interest, but yeah, you're the most appropriate and um, you always show up, so I'm sure I won't be needed, but there if necessary. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, I went to the Wellington Regional Leadership Committee meeting yesterday. Uh, there were already emails and um, messages floating between mayors around uh, the Wellington region, and it's interesting that uh, the talk of uh, amalgamation that was sort of twittering in the background is almost now a secondary issue to the water issue. So they're much more concerned about ensuring that the water 
uh, issue gets resolved uh, and where they go in that space um, uh, quicker. Um, and I also, you know, being part of the Wellington Regional Leadership Group has given me some insight into what is going on down there. So, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion or debate? Is everyone comfortable with the councillor officer? Justin just indicated that he'd be quite keen to be the second alternative if we, need, if we needed another one after Biddy. So. Um, yeah, look, we'll only need one. I would, if two of us can't attend, then there'd be some, um, we could easily call for further um, representation if needed. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'm probably, I am interested in it. Yep. And I'm probably interested to know what value people are going to bring to that space, if I'm completely honest, because I follow the water stuff pretty hard. So, but anyway, happy with what we're going. Cool. All right. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. All right. So now we move to... Um, the agenda, do we? <laughs> <laughs> and which is our first item is the confirmation of minutes. And uh, so um, I'll move that the uh, uh, the minutes of Council 6th of March 2024 and the minutes of the in-committee meeting of Council 6th of March be recorded as a true and correct record. Moved by Deputy Mayor Allen, seconded by myself. All those in favour? Against carried. Moving now to 6.1, um, general report, uh, I'll move that this be received and recognised as not significant. Can I have a second, please? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Allen. Any questions or um, comments on this report? Councillor Tupper. Oh, just an observation that you um, visited Te Whano, Madison and Masonic, I wondered. Um, was there any uh, trends or similar experiences that, that you heard through those visits and, and, and yeah, what's the challenges they're facing? Um, thank you for that. I just um, took the opportunity when I had a few days to um, of not being as busy as I sometimes am to and this came about through some comments made at community wellbeing and older persons and uh, meetings like that where there was a, a general sort of anecdotal sort of message given that there were some real challenges around care in particular, not so much the um, villa type uh, residential uh, type thing. Um, and it's becoming increasingly obvious that uh, there's some real challenges in that space. And it's more about, from the villagers' point of view, about independent assessors uh, for those people being assessed as not needing care but could remain independent living. So there are a number of um, available beds in these um, um, facilities at the moment, which is causing concern as to the viability and sustainability of those those facilities. Some real challenges um, in that space. Uh, the good news was that uh, staffing levels uh, are good. There's been an influx of um, immigration uh, into the district and um, that has helped uh, considerably with uh, the number of registered nurses that are uh, here. Um, and um, yeah, it's challenging space in these economic times as you can imagine. So my intention is to further develop some ongoing um, talk, if you like, and conversations around what the community um, needs to us to advocate and enable uh, in that space. Right, moving to um, 6.2, and... Um, which is the proposed remit to the 2024 LGNZ AGM. I'll move 2.1, 2.2, uh, let the report be received. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Allen, thank you. All those in favour? Against carried. Uh, so we have 2.3, that council support the following remit for consideration to the Zone 3 meeting, and if successful, the LGNZ 
AGM 2024, that LDNC lobbies central government to ensure that Maori wards and constituencies are treated the same as all other wards and that they should not be subject to a referendum. And I'm going to ask Councillor Tommy Hana, who's uh, the proposer of this uh, remit, if he wishes to um, probably uh, speak to the report before we even ask for questions or clarifications. Thank you. Oh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much, um, Mayor Bernie. I just firstly wanted to acknowledge um, our CE, um, Sue and Amy, um, that were really um, so strong in supporting us and helping us to get the remit together. And so just wanted to acknowledge the amount of work and time that they, that they gave to us in preparing this today. Um, I know that both myself and Councillor Gori Tapa um, are humbled to bring this before our Council today. And I'm reminded that in the time um, that this council adopted Māori Ward um, for the district, um, we did so unanimously, and it was um, the first and only council in Aotearoa that did so unanimously. And so uh, without going on long-winded about today, it is about ensuring that our Māori wards are treated the same as any other constituency wards. And if there is support here today from this council um, for that to be shared with the uh, zone 3 meeting, then um, we would be extremely humbled and proud of our district to do so. Um, I take the report as read, so I don't think I need to go on any more than that, but it's certainly about uh, recognising our treaty partners in our district and nationally and, and the ability for them to participate uh, in local government, which we don't get enough participation. So, kia ora. Thanks, Justin. Um, I might just ask the Chief Executive to explain the process, if you like, in terms of what happens if we, um, you know, all following today's decision and then ongoing. Uh, through you, Your Worship. Uh, so the Zone 3 meeting has been held um, Thursday and Friday of this week. Uh, and so, um, uh, obviously, depending on the decision that um, this Council makes, the intent would be for the remit to be presented to the Zone 3 meeting. Um, what happens is the zone, zone votes on it by way of, um, it, does, it doesn't have a resolution of those councils. Essentially, the mayors put their hand up and say, yeah, we'll back that. Uh, it needs five councils to support it. And then what it does is it goes through the LGNZ AGM process. And so that's where AGN, LGNZ puts it through its criteria and it will determine whether it is um, appropriate to go to the AGM for consideration. An important point um, that I, I think I'd like to make is that, so if it does get chosen to go into the LGNZ AGM, a reminder that all remits come to this table where you debate as a table on the guidance, what guidance you're going to give to Mayor Bernie ahead of the LGNZ AGM. So, this decision is to get it into the um, into the mix, and then if it if it does get um, chosen to go through the process, council will still have an opportunity to actually consider its views on whether it votes in support or against of the remit at the LGNZ AGM, which from memory is in June or July uh, of this year, August of this year, uh, and, and then. If a remit passes, the point of a remit is that it is to be given priority within the LGNZ work program. So it would then um, shape LGNZ's advocacy position into government. Uh, and obviously it's worth acknowledging that LGNZ are already taking an advocacy position, but it's not it's not been formalised by an LGNZ AGM. Um, and Councillor Tommy Hunter, just remind us, the other districts that have already been party to this remit and have put it to their councils? Uh, so currently, I believe, um, Palmerston North City Council have um, have passed the remit and also Horizons have also passed the remit. And the only one I understand that hasn't passed it, that they didn't actually get it up, was Manawatu District. Um, but, but currently we have um, <coughs> two have. But what I also understand in the process is um, they only really needed one council to take it to the remit, but five uh, Māori elected representatives nationally to back that um, for it to happen. So I suppose what I'm saying is that it, it, it can happen anyway. Um, 
I'm thinking, but this is whether our council support the process still. Any questions or Councillor Jennings? Yeah, can I just ask the question um, of Justin around um, why is why is the remit only focused on the referendum point and not consistency with all the all legislation? Like, because it, yeah, I, I guess I'm trying to understand. But is the primary objective to remove? Any referendum, whether it's a Māori ward or, you know, potentially that all representation arrangements could be subject to referendum, or is it about consistency with all legislation, consistent treatment of Māori wards with general wards? I'll um, I'll answer this, Councillor Jennings. the The intent of the rematch is to lead an advocacy position to government around um, what is essentially the potential threat to Māori wards, where there is an intended um, desire of the coalition government to require the establishment of Māori wards and the retention of Māori wards to be requiring a referendum. And when this was debated, sorry, discussed in the Māori Ward cohort across our Horizons region, uh, the initial wording of the remit, there was some really good corridor. I wasn't there, but I'm told, about, well, let's not just make this about Māori Wards. It, let, like, let's make sure that this is about um, ensuring that all wards are treated the same as Māori Wards. Uh, so the intent of the wording was to try and ensure that the focus wasn't just about don't beat up on Māori wards. It was, well, actually, let's treat Māori wards the same way as um, all other wards. The wording associated with the referendum is directly associated and correlated to what the government's intention is. Can I have a follow-up question? You may. Yeah, because my, my concern, like just putting it out there, the concern I have, and maybe you can answer this, is um, that if we're saying treat all wards the same, there is already some legislative differences and legislative provisions that mean that the wards aren't treated the same for various reasons. And so, for example, my understanding is that the Māori wards at the moment don't need to meet the fair representation um methodology so that has to be within the plus or minus 10 percent of the other wards and so if you if we're advocating for a if we support this and advocate for um wards to be treated exactly the same then essentially what we're saying at the moment is um we'd be willing or open to losing one mighty one maori ward because that's what the outcome would be is because the having two multi wards means that we're out of step with the fair representation um, methodology or the calculations. So I just wanted to be clear about, um, yeah, are, are, we, are we advocating for consistency with all, um, all parts of the, you know, with all requirements around wards or not? Uh, through you, Your Worship, I don't think that was the intent of the remit, um, Councillor Jennings. The, the intent is directly about um, what has been posed as the requirement for a community referendum. So it's, uh, okay. yeah, the, the remit should be read in that vein. Thank you all. So um, put uh, the recommendation. All those in favour? Oh, sorry. Hasn't been moved? No, you're right. Sorry. Hasn't. My apologies. Um, 2.3, that Council support the following remit for consideration at the Zone 3 meeting and, if successful, the LGNZ AGM 2024. That LGNZ lobbies central government to ensure that Maori wards and constituencies are treated the same as all other wards and that they should not be subject to a referendum. Um, I move it. Thank you, Councillor Hori de Pa. Um, Councillor... Tommy Hunter, do you wish to second the motion? No. So, Deputy Mayor Allen seconded. Any further discussion or debate? 
Deputy Mayor. Look, I need to say a couple of words. It's an important remit. Um, and I thank Councillor Tamihana for reminding us of the unanimity that surrounded the last decision, that last council. That was a historic moment for our district, but also for our nation. The spotlight went on Horafenua when, when as a council table, we unanimously embraced uh, Maori wards. Um, and we did so in the hope and belief that the existence of a Maori ward uh, would add value to our decision making and would be a concrete way of expressing the concept of partnership. And I want to put on the record today that that has happened. The value add from Councillor Hori Tapa and Councillor Tamihana has been immense. The challenges they brought to us, although at times painful, have been necessary. And I, for one, have felt so much better as a representative for our district for the existence of those two people. My dream scenario today, and I in no way take this as me trying to tell anyone what to do or what to think, but wouldn't it be wonderful if there was the same unanimity today on this issue as there was in the last triennium? And I say this because I'm appalled that the coalition government of today is trying to return back the clock to the bad old days. So just to remind us, there is no ability for a referendum to overturn council's decision on the ward system. Whether we go with the ward system or whether we go at large, there is no ability for a referendum uh, when it comes to us determining as a local authority on the number of wards we have. There is no ability for a referendum to overturn our decision on the number of councillors within each ward. These are all subject to the ifs and buts, which Councillor Jennings has said about the plus and minus, etc. And there is no ability for a referendum to overturn Council's decision on the number of elected members overall. However, there is the ability under this proposal for us to single out Māori and Māori wards, where the majority can overturn a decision. What do we call that? What's the term for that? when we single out Māori, but we don't for any other decision. I am very angry about this. This is an appalling return to the bad old days. The same coalition government is talking about localism, talking about putting decision-making more into the hands of the locals. How is that consistent with this proposal? Mr Mayor, I am absolutely in support of this. I'm very thankful that, that the Horizons region, the Māori uh, Ward Councils have got together and brought this not just to us, to the region, because I want this to be as widespread um, a coalition around the ability for us to determine on us as a district to determine through the normal processes we use for every other decision making when it comes to representation, that we retain that right when it comes to Māori Wards. Um, I just like to, right. I just like to thank uh, councillors Tamihana and Rita Pa for bringing this to the table. Uh, I echo uh, Deputy uh, Allen's uh, comments, and I'd also see great value in our Māori ward councillors, not only on this table, but it's, and I've met quite a few of the zone free Māori ward councillors and across the nation, and uh, I think they provide great dialogue and uh, happy to support this remit. Thank you. Councillor Black. Yeah, I have a... Based on a, my idea of a broad democratic principle, I have a great unease with anything that seeks to take away a citizen's referendum, um, regardless of what it's about. And, yeah, and good conscience, and my decision would be I won't support this. Anyone else wish to speak? Okay, so the motion's on the table. All those in favour? Show of hands would be good. Mark or division? Yeah, uh, division's called for and accepted, yes. <coughs> Just wait for Grayson to get that on the table. Thank you. So, um, let's start the other way this time. Councillor Jennings. I'll vote for 
Thank you. Councillor Tukapur? Four. Councillor Grimstone? Aye. Councillor Young? Four. Councillor Proctor? Four. Councillor Horry Par? Four. Councillor Boyle? Four. Councillor Barker? <coughs> Against. Councillor Tammy Hanna? Aye. Councillor Olson? Four. Deputy Mayor Al? Four. And I will vote for Olson. It's carried. Thank you. Oh, um, Councillor Allen, uh, Councillor is here as well. Oh, did Councillor Brannigan, did you hear all that discussion that we've just had on that matter? Yes, I did, uh, Mr. Mayor, and I'm voting for Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so the motion's passed. Thank you. Um, Councillor Brannigan, now that you um, are with us, are you um, with us for a little while or are you needing to um, vacate? Well, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, well, that's what I'm, yeah. Can you hear me, Councillor Brannigan? Sorry, yeah, I'll be back on mute. Um, I'll be here for the rest of this agenda. I can't uh, join you for the end committee, unfortunately. Okay, all right. In that case, we'll, we'll stick with our um, uh, agenda as it is. And Sorry, um, we'll go to 7.1, which is the service delivery section 17A review prioritise plans and as Ashley comes to the table um, could I move 2.1 and 2.2 seconded by Councillor Young, thank you all those in favour against carried, thank you Ashley Thank you Your Worship, um, this report uh, is the follow up work that officers said they'd bring back following the meeting in December the attached document uh, to the paper outlines the proposed work program to complete Section 17A reviews going forward. As you'll see, and as Council noted in December, the organisation is not currently compliant with all its obligations under Section 17A. Um, so going forward, we hope to uh, put this plan in place so we get up to speed with that. Um, one point I would like to note is that the activities that are identified under no review is to be undertaken. Um, does not mean that we won't review the way we're undertaking these activities. However, as Section 17A is really is very prescribed um, and can be a costly exercise, would look to do a review, but without being so prescribed of how we do that. Happy to take questions. Yes, I took a yeah, um, yeah, that point about cost, I, in undertaking these reviews, I note there's quite a few in that resource column which requires external consultants, and um, that's necessary, obviously, sometimes to get that independent um, view, but I wondered whether the cost of this full work plan has been captured in the LTP, LTP budget. Um, for the first three years, and uh, I'll maybe answer that first. So we have captured in the LTP budget um, for two reviews to be externally completed each year going forward. Okay. Uh, and then um, of these external consultants, um, we have that see, know and do triangle there's a couple of these, um, which for me, based on um, historical experience, I would like to know who these, well, not necessarily who they are, but just to check that they are independent and some of them we don't use again because we've learned from our mistakes, I guess. Um, what One might be the... You know, there's strong views out there that we wasted quite a bit in the um, landfill stuff, like external consultants to the tune of, I don't know, was it 800 to a million dollars, 800,000 to a million dollars, um, hit the papers. So I just, yeah, I want to have a closer look. It's an OPEX decision about who they are, but I'm 
I'd like to see it. Um, even when I talk about independence, uh, that's economic development review. Yeah, it's clear that there's no existing history or association with either staff or board members of that entity. Um, yeah, that's, I just want some reassurances in that space. Uh, thank you, Councillor Tukapura, Tukapua, and through you, um, Your Worship. I think probably just to um, give you some assurances, so when we talk about external consultant or funding, uh, we have budgeted $40,000 a year um, in the LTP, so we anticipate that we can achieve between one to two Section 17A reviews a year. Um, in some instances, it will make sense for that Section 17A to be carried out internally, uh, as we're currently doing, for example, in the Three Waters space. But as you highlight, there will be some circumstances where, given the context, it's far more appropriate that it be done independently. I mean, absolutely take um, the point that uh, where, where independence is required, that we um, that we seek absolute assurance that that independence is, is what it is, independent. Am I right in thinking too that when we start the 70 section of 70 a process for any particular activity that a report comes to council anyway to identify that or we just automatically just start the process? We would automatically start the process following the direction given it as part of this work plan. But through your worship, there'll always be context, right? And so if we take the first one, economic development, there's some context to that. We council have provided some previous direction, have signalled what role they'll want to play in that involvement. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I note that um, the last um, Section 17A review it did provide an opportunity where some EMs, it was open to all of us, but only a few of us um, turned up, uh, that we were interviewed by that um, consultant. Mm -hmm. So there is an opportunity um, because I guess the review is undertaking how a service is governed, how it is funded and how it is delivered. Um, but the last question I have, and because overall, I, I think, yeah, that it's prioritised so in the right way I think across the three years but I did wonder where it says no no review that last table um, based on cost effectiveness there's, there's the property some of those commercial leases and things which I, I'm a little bit interested in giving that um, past information I've seen whereas we're not yielding the value that we should from those necessarily and um, yeah it needs some improving so I just wouldn't like to just not do anything at all because um, there's some value in that space I'd like to see increased hopefully others get me just so the process going forward would be to bring this prioritisation work plan back to council on a yearly basis to review going forward so it might be that we've identified in 24 oh sorry 25 that these are the key ones that we'd like to do but priorities may change and we come back to council and that gets readjusted to be actually what we need to highlight or focus on a different area so each year we'll bring this back um, and look at what is the priority going forward and that's where those changes can be made as well or depending on what's going through council at that, at that point in time. And just reiterating that just because it's not on a Section 17A review timetable doesn't mean to say that a review won't be done. It just won't be a Section 17A review. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Just keen, I guess, on, on the prioritisation as it's presented to us right now, particularly around the aquatic centre and the community centre and libraries. I just kind of feel that 
maybe 26 feels a little bit too far out given we've got a long term plan process at the moment where we're potentially consulting on reduced hours um, and thinking about the timing for the next long term plan as well that it may be good to actually have a review of those two facilities to inform future processes so just kind of wondered if there was anything in that 25, 26 space that could be swapped around from a prioritisation perspective. Yeah, I, I suppose that um, the challenge is that there is two activities there. One where we um, are required by Office of the Auditor General to do a Section 17A, um, and the other where it is an activity of our organisation that has not had a Section 17A for some time, versus if you look at our libraries and aquatics facilities, you know, um, it had a pretty comprehensive Section 17A when Council made the decision back in 2016 to bring Te Horofano Trust in-house. So it's... I think the important thing is to emphasise is that a Section 17A is a very prescribed process that looks at a type of methodology and won't always give you probably what you might think it will give you versus if the question is how can we do things better or save some money or um, think about things differently, that can always be done in the absence of a Section 17A review. Councillor Brannigan, are you, I can't see you on the screen, are you there? Uh, there you go. All right. Um, yes, I wish I thought to start, I was going to declare that to give you a chance to have a conflict, conflict of interest, so I'll step out of this conversation. Thank you. That's so noted. Councillor Jennings. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, yeah, just two questions for the team. Um, one was around solid waste. And I'm just getting my head around whether the 17A here needs to be accelerated or slowed down in terms of sequencing around decisions around, or potential decisions around levels of service changes. Um, obviously there'll be some decisions that have made through this long-term plan process that will have an impact, but as we will discuss previously, there's still some further decision making and further thinking in that solid waste space um, to come. And so I just wanted to get a view on, yeah, I guess the sequencing in terms of the, and the timing of that solid waste 17A. And then the second point was, um, in terms of the 2025 regulatory services, can any of those individual lines um, be advanced on their own. So for example, animal control, um, and for various reasons we've talked about before, is, is there you know, an opportunity to look at some of those specific items um, on a more accelerated basis rather than doing them all as a group? Uh, through you, your worship. Um, Councillor Jennings, I'll answer your second question first. Yes, we can accelerate. Um, any of these. Why we generally group them together um, is for cost efficiency, um, but as certainly we can um, accelerate any one of these if that is what the table would like. Um, in terms of solid waste, um, I will hand it over to uh, Daniel Hay to respond to. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, what you can expect, Councillor Jennings, is some early thinking um, alongside consultation, feedback and decision making for the long term plan uh, to be brought forward around timing for the upcoming review. So it's probably going to look, I suppose the, the overall outcome will probably look more like a business case and a, you know, a, a review of contract um, to enable us to make decisions around further engagement with the community or a, a shift in level of service or, or procurement. So what we'll do is bring a, a program that sits alongside that. Um, it simply sits in here as a line item to say ideally before end of year would fulfil the requirements of a 17A, but as you um, rightly point out, there's a number of other complexities and level of service decisions that uh, 
elected members will be taken and give direction throughout that process. That, that's awesome. Thanks, Daniel. That's super. Cheers. Yeah. And intending to drive a lot of that um, in, with internal resource uh, rather than outsourcing to um, Councillor Tukapua's point earlier. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. So, um, recommendation 2.3, the Council endorsed the attached Section 17A prioritised work programme. Mover and seconder, please. Deputy Mayor Allen. Thank you, Councillor Grimstone, seconding. Um, any further discussion? Put the recommend. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes. Tell me how. Apologies. No, um, I did just want to resonate too with what Councillor um, Kenning said, and I appreciate the um, the feedback that's come back because I too was in my mind trying to work out what that looks like when we apply it to the different um, to the different things. But I have a level of comfort now of knowing that we will get that information in due course. So thank you. Put the resolution. All those in favour? Against. Kerry, thank you. Um, look, I'm conscious that um, the Deputy Chair of the Fox and Community Board has been extremely patient and been uh, here all afternoon. I didn't actually see you there, um, Trevor, but we're going to change the agenda so that we move to 9.2, uh, the proceedings of the TRO Fox and Community Board, um, and welcome you to the table. Um, and first of all, as you do so, um, can I just move uh, 2.1, 2.2, um, that we receive the reports. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Allen, Councillor Hori Pa. Uh, all those in favour? Against carried. Sorry, page 189. Um, so, Trevor, welcome to the, um, the table. Uh, before we get into the... Um, actual recommendations that are in front of us. Is there anything you wish to add to the um, a report or anything? Anything you wish to bring to our attention? Just turn your mic on. Sorry, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me here. Um, I'm standing. John Girling is away. Um, he called me on in late notice, so forgive me if I don't know everything. But we'll find out, we'll communi communicate as we will. Goodbye. Um, so we do have uh, two recommendations on the, um, on the, in the agenda, and we might do these separately. Oh, Ashley, yes, please. Ashley's going to join you at the table, Trevor. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, first, before I start and um, introduce the report, I'd just like to note an apology from Hayden Tudor, the representative of Hapu Owners, who has co-led this process alongside Te Awaho Fox and Community Board. Unfortunately, Hayden um, is unable to make it, but has asked to note that hapu owners are in support of the paper. Um, I'd like to give you a quick high-level reminder of the process that we've been through to get to today. Um, as you know, the current policy um, was adopted in October 2009, some time ago. Uh, we initiated a review of the policy back in 2019. However, we encountered some delays. So in resuming the work in 2023, we held an initial workshop with elected members here um, in August, providing you some history of the endowment land, the associated land. We gave a deep dive into the current policy landscape, legislative influences, funding mechanisms, and funding allocation. Within this workshop, officers um, sought direction from you, particularly around the extent of involvement uh, from iwi and hapu to be involved in the process. You provided us direction uh, that you wanted uh, iwi and hapu to be involved in this, and we 
uh, coordinated a hui with the representatives um, inviting Mu Poko, Ngāti Raukawa, Rangatane, Hapu owners, Kirikiri ward councillors, Māori ward councillors, Te Awaho Fox and Community Board and Mayor Burney. In September, a hui was held uh, and where Kirikiri ward councillors, Māori ward councillors, Te Awaho Fox and Community Board, uh, Mayor Wandan and Hapu owners were in attendance. The core objective of that hui was to provide a platform for each participating group to articulate their aspirations regarding the Foxton Beach Endowment Fund. The outcome of that hui was to jointly write a paper which is attached on the Foxton Beach Endowment Fund review paper process. The paper that is attached has been endorsed by Te Awaho Foxton Community Board. Um, which was written by the representatives. There's been many, many iterations of that paper, um, which was to ensure that was involved, all perspectives and views were captured. This paper was endorsed by Hapu owners and Te Awaho Fox and Community Board at a hui at Paranui Marae in December. As you can see from the paper that has been tabled, uh, Te Awaho Fox and Community Board endorsed the paper uh, for it to come through to council. They also noted in the uh, meeting that they do not endorse the funds coming from the endowment fund to do the, to do the process, the review process. So they've asked um, that council don't endorse uh, that. Um, officers uh, have a, a conflicting view on that. Uh, we've not budgeted for the review. We were initiating that the uh, funds within the endowment fund would pay for the review process. Um, in completing a rough estimate of the cost uh, that we think uh, will take to to complete the review is roughly $40,000. Uh, part of this will be officer time and is already within budgets. Uh, we expect that there will be uh, some potential legal fees and then some uh, compensation through to HAPU for their involvement in this. Uh, happy to take any questions. Um, I do want to give you, Trevor, the opportunity uh, at some stage to um, speak to uh, the recommendations, but just initially just see any questions from um, elected members. There appear to be none. So, um, Trevor, do you wish to make any um, comments to either of those recommendations? I'd like to make a comment. Um, this is personal, not necessarily at the Tower Board Community Group. Um, as, at our last meeting, we were um, having a discussion about the costs, which um, Ashley just presented to you. Um, and we, we felt, um, after having a, a bit of a, a chat later on, that uh, the council should be responsible for the cost, mainly because the council has um, majority say over the fund itself. We're only representative for the community to put together suggestions to where the, the funds may be utilised. Um, and we have been um, reminded consistently that council has last say. So therefore, um, of that opinion, if council has last say, council carries a burden. Thank you, appreciate that. Are there, um, does any members have any questions for, for Trevor? Deputy Mayor, I'll ju just to test that, uh, Trevor, and thank you for that explanation, because to be honest, during the board meeting, very little was said by way of justification for that request of council to meet the cost rather than the endowment fund. But just to test your thinking around that, given that the project is about the endowment fund, that's what it's all about and how that is managed in the future, would it not be appropriate to say that that fund should, should be responsible, the endowment fund should be responsible for funding that process, do you see? Do you see that as logic? I can see the point you're making, Councillor Allen. Um, 
And Trevor, I don't want to put you on the spot, no. especially if you're not speaking on behalf of the yeah. board. Yeah. Um, that this is a personal view that you're. Yeah. This, this is a personal view because yeah. I've been called in to stand for our, our chairperson. Um, the the thing that I can see is that we put applications in on behalf of community board uh, community persons for funding. Funding is allocated at fifty uh, percent of the total cost. <laughs> of any development that may be arising in our area. Um, so with the, the control of the funds not being in our hands, why should we forfeit the bill? Um, I wonder whether the Chief Executive might be able to answer the question is if we don't take it from the endowment fund, where will we get the budget from? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just before I answer your question, it's probably worth noting the Te Awaho Fox and Community Board have been consistent in their views um, that this work shouldn't be funded from the endowment fund. Um, and it was on my suggestion that they've passed this resolution because I thought it was important that they make their, they express their views formally to council. Um, we have, we don't have any budget for this work. Um, it was officers' view right from the start that the most logical place that this would be funded from is the endowment fund itself. Um, so council would need to provide additional funding. While that might not be in the vicinity of $40,000 because some some of that cost is um, driven by staff time, uh, there, will be, there will still be costs associated with legal fees, um, the consultation process, because we will ultimately need to consult on a draft policy, uh, but also um, making sure that we appropriately uh, acknowledge the role of hapu in contributing to the process. That not, um, none of that is um, within existing budgets. Thank you, Councillor Jennings. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, I did. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a just a clarification question. Um, and I might be completely off the reservation, but like reading through the papers, obviously within the scope of the review, is there's, there's no um, aspect that relates to what is actually the future purpose, form, and function of the the endowment fund. I like there's nothing that would lead to an option to be considered. I should the fund be wound up? Should it be? Um, so can I just get clarity that that's not an option that's on the table in terms of what's not within the scope of the review, as in, you know, as a potential outcome that it could be wound up? Just checking whether Ashley wanted to comment on that question. Um, but that's not what I've heard in the conversations from Community Board and, and HAPU but more a recognition that um, the current way the policy is written and is um, implemented um, isn't fit for purpose and doesn't reflect the aspirations of all of those around the table. And, and perhaps okay, just, thanks. And just to, to reinforce that, um, <coughs> Councillor Jennings, as the liaison councillor on the board, that has never been uh, a sort of subject of consideration during this process. Right, so um, as I said, we will deal um, with these individually. Um, and thank you, Trevor, for your um, input into that. Um, appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, certainly. Okay. Um, like I said, I, I was caught on at the last minute, but I was voicing my opinions. Um, if there's any uh, panui or anything that comes from the meeting, I'd appreciate that copy go to my uh, fellow members so they understand what's going on at the Community Council Board. Um, and I really appreciate the time that you've allocated us. Um, we might not be uh, coincide on uh, the, the matters that are arising at the moment, but no doubt if um, the Community Board is, is notified that there's no funds allocated for this purpose, um, the Community Board might think otherwise. Uh, but at this stage, I can only suggest that um, please send a pardon to all of my 
members of the community board would be appreciated. And thank you very much for your time, everyone. So, no, thank you, Trevor. Okay, so um, we're going to slightly amend these recommendations. Um, so, 2.3 uh, will read that Council adopt the Foxton Beach Endowment Fund review process, including reference to pages 85 and 86 of Appendix A, the complete work. And um, the same when we get to 2.4, we'll uh, exclude. Uh, well, the, the recommendation will read that Council fund the review of the Foxton Beach Endowment Fund review. So, is someone prepared to move uh, 2.3? Councillor Olsen, thank you. Seconder? Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Any further discussion or debate? All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Um, so we now move to 2.4. That will read that council fund the review of the Foxton Beach Endowment Fund review. Do I have a mover or a seconder? Mm -hmm. Council took a poor. Oh, I want to change it, but... So I'm, I'm assuming that if it's on the table when it's voted against, then that's it. There's no need for a further recommendation. That Does that mean that we have to then have a recommendation that says that the endowment fund pay for the review? Yeah, yeah, okay. But if we don't have a mover and a second for this recommendation, then someone can move uh, uh, can re move a resolution. Right. So, at this stage, is anyone prepared to move and second this resolution? So moved by Councillor Tamihana. Is there a seconder? Okay. Councillor Boyle is seconding the motion. So, um, Councillor Tamahana, you wish to speak to it? Um, yeah, kia ora. I um, haven't really followed this one, if I'm completely honest, but I think um, just from memory, when we've discussed uh, the Te Awahu Fox and Community Board and the matter around the endowment, it's always been um, a struggle space. And I do remember we got to a point where we considered that we would freeze expenditure on the endowment. Um, and... and in relation to this process that we're now undertaking. And so I would have considered by council um, freezing the access to the endowment that we were taking on the responsibility of carrying through um, this review process. And so I suppose that's probably my recollection of it. I'm happy to be corrected, but um, I stand behind the Fox and Community Board's decision today that they brought this recommendation to us as a council and, um, and support their recommendations as such. Um, I'll just seek some clarity from the Chief Executive as to whether we have actually stopped any process in terms of the endowment fund. I think what Councillor Tommy Hanna is um, probably referring to is the conversation around the $5 million um, threshold of which we're currently in excess of that, um, but there's certainly no freeze on expenditure. There, there is cost um, going out of the endowment fund um, regularly, whether that be the grants that you have previously um, endorsed or whether that be the operational costs associated with that fund. Uh, what has been paused is the um, any asset sales that are not linked to a leasehold agreement where we're legally required to sell um, the property. Uh, thank you for that correction, and I'll um, correct my statement as such uh, to as the CEO is reflected. Okay, so we do have that resolution on the table. Does anyone wish to speak to it? If you may, I'll. Yeah, look, um, and I want to acknowledge and thank Mr Chambers for turning up pretty much at short notice and um, to, to put forward the board's views. Well, in fact, at times, his own views, because... To be honest, when that 
motion appeared on, when that motion was moved at the Fox and Community Board, I was unable to speak because I declared an, an interest around predetermination when it came to the council table. But what disappointed me was that there was no real time given to expressing the reasons to support that recommendation. And without those reasons, I couldn't do what I usually try to do as a liaison council, which is make sure that those the underlying reasoning for, for a recommendation, uh, what those reasons were. Um, Mr Chambers' comment about how the because the final decisions around the, the freeholding fund or the endowment fund, because those final decisions sit with council, therefore the costs should lie with council. I think don't address the fact that in the past on a number of occasions, and I would argue on this occasion also, because this is about the free about the the endowment fund moving forward, how it is managed and who who has a say in the processes around that, it seems to me to entirely logical that the endowment fund should resource that in principle, but also in quantum. When you look at the amount of money involved, um, for that to be a, a sudden additional expense for which we have no budget, I think is inappropriate. So with absolute respect to the board, on this occasion, I do have to disagree with, for, with them for those reasons. Thank you. Any further? Councillor Jennings. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. I was just briefly going to speak against the motion as well. I think the cost of the review is an operational cost associated with the administration of the fund. Um, so it, it is entirely appropriate that the, the fund should um, meet that cost. Um, I probably would have, might have entertained or been um, persuaded if it had been presented as a co-fund um, type arrangement. Um, but that's not doesn't appear to be on the table, so I'll be voting against the motion. Thank you. All right. So, as it is on the table, uh, those that support recommendation two point four. You sorry, you're wanting a division certainly. Okay, um, Deputy Mayor Allen, against. Councillor Olsen, against. Councillor Tamihana, <coughs> Councillor Barker, against. Councillor Boyle, against. Councillor Horridge Parr, for. Councillor Proctor, against. Councillor Young, against. Councillor Grimstone, no. Councillor Tukapur, against. Councillor Jennings, Against. Councillor Brannigan. Against. And I am also voting against. So that motion is lost. Two votes to 11. So um, does there someone around the table who wishes to propose a new resolution? Councillor Tukapur. That the review costs be covered by the endowment fund. Do I have a, sorry, did I hear Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor Allen has seconded that. So does anyone wish to speak to that? Other than, sorry, Councillor Tugapur, do you wish to speak to that? No. Councillor Deputy Mayor Allen, you've said your piece as well. Any further discussion or debate? Sorry, Councillor oh. Tukupur. Off um, It is the most logical um, way to fund this review um, for the reasons expressed earlier and the advice from the Chief Executive. But I... Um, That what maybe yeah I note that it was a personal view so I can't, it's not for the whole of the community board but at least um, in my time the the recommendations that come through for use of this fund uh, nine times out of ten they will, they will go through there's very few I can think of that we didn't support. Um, and 
yeah, council was just the administrator, but at the same time, when those recommendations come through, we're, we're weighing it up um, across a whole lot of priorities for that community. Um, an example I can think of was Holborn Reserve. There was a, quite a grand plan for that place, and we knew that it would have to be a staged approach. You couldn't, because man, it, look, it looked awesome. Like I thought, man, if money wasn't a problem, yeah, <laughs> cool, do it all, but that, that's not the reality. And so, um, you know, requesting funds from this endowment to contribute to that, but at the same time, council's contribution and other things it's we're looking across the board and yeah most of the time we can can approve those um, recommendations and sometimes we simply can't because of competing priorities and that's really what it comes back to and look that that fund has done some great things for both foxton and, and the foxton beach and uh, um the review does need to happen um, it's overdue, in, in my view, but yeah, it certainly needs to be funded by, yeah, this, not, not as an extra budget line that we come up with when we're already pressed beyond, you know, everyone knows this. Yes, I'll tell me how to, oh, could I, um, look, I just wanted to, um, say, a big thank you to the Te Aho Fox and Community Board because it's at, it's, at, it's at their discretion they brought the recommendation to us with some robust conversations and it wouldn't be right for me not to fuck them under them bringing that to this table hence why I supported um, the recommendation initially even knowing the situation we find ourselves in um, but I also suppose it gives me the opportunity um, to say how lucky this council are to have a bucket of money sitting there um, at their discretion and even not with the support of the Fox and Community Board's recommendations to us, which is why they're there. And so, uh, but I'll leave it there, um, and I'll vote accordingly to how I feel at the time. Sure. Is anyone calling for a division on this? Because I'm quite happy just to put the vote in. Yeah, just show our hands, please. Um, all those in favour? Against? Oh, sorry, I was in favour as well. All right, the motion's carried. Thank you. Okay, so we're now moving to uh, 7.2, the liquefaction policy approach update, and uh, Blair is coming to uh, the table to introduce this report. Can I move 3.1 and 3.2 that the report be received? Uh, seconded by someone, please. Councillor Tupapua, thank you. All those in favour? Against, carried. Thank you, Blair. Thank you, Risha. Um, so, following recent <coughs> completion of a desktop top assessment um, and council, council briefings that followed, we're now seeking to adopt the updated maps and policy approach, um, not a formal policy at this time. The update in the liquefaction policy approach is proposed to further simplify the process through which our community can understand, assess and determine the risk of liquefaction prior to development. Um, so the real focus here is on um, making it better and easier um, for our community. Key change is really bringing the um, option forward of requiring testing at subdivision. So currently a lot of the testing is done at um, where people go to build and then it's a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one scenario whereas if we bring it forward then we have greater visibility earlier um, and better ability to make decisions. Testing is required um, at the building stage either way so we still um, can't avoid the need to test. Each of the proposed changes aims to enhance the current policy process and its application in the community, improving visibility and guidance, reducing time, cost and overall effort. Recommendation um, our recommendation would be the adoption of option three, which is a proposed updated policy approach and resulting modified screening tool, and option four, um, which came out of council, which would um, see us continue our efforts to further enhance the policy approach going forward. Questions? Just for clarity, um, Blair, so you're recommending 3.5 and 3.6, is that correct? 
Sorry. Or either or. Uh, probably 6.3 and 6.4. Uh, maybe give them a summary. But, but with regards to the resolutions, um, it is 3.5 and 3.6. So, so it's, it's and that's an and. It should, that, that's an error. Yeah, in sorry. It should be an and. It should be an and, not an or. Yeah, so oh, it's sorry. saying that we. Uh, rec we're recommending option three, but we're saying in addition to that, we're also doing option four, which is obvious, which to be specific came from the guidance that Councillor Proctor and Councillor Jennings gave in the work that they did with um, Blair off the back of the workshops, multiple workshops we've had with Council on liquefaction. Councillor Burnigan. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, Blair, hey, thanks for the report, um, all the reports and all the work you've put into this, and it's, uh, it's hugely technical. And I think you said um, a, a minute ago that the, um, we'll get something the public might understand, and <laughs> I think even some of us that work in this space struggle to understand some of this stuff, so um, I think you're a bit hopeful there, but um, what the question is, Blair, um, option 3.5, are you reasonably comfortable with that? But I think what most of us are looking for is a compromise where um, we, we you know, um, align to the MB guidance, whatever that might be, and hopefully we get some more sense on that. But also um, we mitigate some of the costs of people building in areas that um, have been identified as possible liquefaction. Um, you know, we've... We spoke at nauseam about the, um, you know, the the costs and some of you've heard me talk about the costs and some of the areas, the coastal areas, in, in terms of what you're well aware of. So, in your view, does 3.5 somewhat partially give us some hope that um, some of those costs can be mitigated um, to allow us to build the houses we want to build? I through your worship, you speak um, the. The intent is to um, really, I guess, one of the, the benefits of what we're proposing is through adoption of the maps, it gives us a better starting point from a guidance perspective. And then um, the testing at that point will hopefully reduce the frequency of the CPT testing, which is the significant testing, the drilling, and the high cost. Um, so the frequency of that should decline. Um, and by moving testing to subdivision, it'll give us more guidance and the community more guidance um, around what they're up for. So... There could be subdivisions in the community at the moment where people will turn up to build and they'll be surprised with the cost of um, foundations required to go on the ground to, to, um, to build their dream home. Um, the intent here is that we bring that testing forward so uh, both ourselves at council have a better idea of the land um, and that we can um, advise forward of um, any development and what that land looks like too. And it's possible for a follow-up there, Mr. Mead? Certainly. Yeah, I am not talking about there, but we work in terms of, I think, 3.6. And um, we um, will we'll see if we have some conversations with MB. We'll that look at uh, potentially some clarification about, um, again, we're talking, there's two things, the cost of uh, doing the testing to identify the quality of the land to build on, but also the the remedial um, costs of uh, putting, a, putting a building platform down, uh, should it be um, identified, perhaps not the best, but you know, you know, you know what I'm saying. Um, in terms of our approach to MB, will that be about, um, can we get some kind of common sense here where if people aren't spending $100,000 on, you know, uh, on, on, on a bit of land uh, to try and build, build a house on before even put a stick of wood on it, you know? Uh, is that the intent of approaching MB to try and get some clarification about um, what we're forcing homeowners to do to build a house? Through your worship, yes. Um, <coughs> absolutely, yes. Um, I'm aware around the table there's a number of questions around um, the sensibility and logic of some of, that, of, of, some of what um, is required or being asked for, and that's, I guess, where I start from. Um, so how do we line up that requirement with um, what's best for our community and also the risk profiles? Um, and likely outcomes. So, yeah, absolutely would be seeking to get more clarity um, around some of those questions that we still have out there um, around risk and 
mobility and need and, and intent, I guess, if that helps. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Castle took a um, Ross, um, uh, following your vain thought, I wondered if you'd be interested in adding MOR to the MB and MFE of 3.6, that is the Ministry of, or new Ministry of Regulation, and um, perhaps, well, might to my knowledge, um, over this term of government, they're going to be casting that lens over every department um, to deregulate some things, to enable some things. So I'm interested in what their position might be in, in this, if any, in the local faction space and some of these. We're looking for some more sensible ways forward. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd I'd like to know if we can add that that ministry to the. That's what I'm looking for. But is there a consensus that that be done, rather than doing an amendment? That Councillor Proctor, you are intimately involved in that. We do have a ministry of deregulation now, do we? So it is. It's been established. Okay. All right. So. I'll just get Grayson to ensure that um, he puts that into the resolution. Councillor Proctor. Uh, I, think, I think that's a great idea, Councillor Tucker. Um, I'm just working through the flowchart and the attachments. And so if we've got medium liquefaction or high liquefaction vulnerability areas, you say you can adopt TC2 type foundations and TC3 type foundations. So that if you design a building uh, that had those foundations, you negate the need to have any further testing or have any testing through the process because you've already adopted a high standard. Uh, through your worship, yes. The, uh, if you look at the likes of Christchurch um, <coughs> and testing that subdivision before, so I've done a lot of testing, so there are scenarios where they might say the subdivision is that deem a TC2 foundation subdivision, so you can just go and knock yourself out and build to that level um, of rebraft or something and then just do it for the subdivision. That's not necessarily that requirement. I know that they actually advertise in that vein. They're probably further along in terms of the quantum of the testing they've done. So, um, yeah, that that's part of the intent, I guess, as we progress, is that you could say, let's say, you know, to the or something that has a level. Um, you know, there's enough tests out there um, that we could take position around that but that's probably continued in that sort of further work on space to get to there. So so we won't need to hire a geotech to test the ground if we adopt those standards already in the building. Sorry, in terms of... Oh, I'm just working through your flowchart. Yeah. So as we say, if you work through the alluvial... Oh, sorry, the relic dunes or the active coastline of dunes work through your whole process and you've found to be highly vulnerable or medium vulnerability. But if your building's already designed to a, to the TC2 or Canterbury, or Canterbury TC2 requirements and TC3 requirements, then you negate the need for a GOT. Is that what your table is saying here? As it sits, there's still some testing I think required, but the intent would be to continue to progress along that, that path. But I guess it's still a determination as to whether it's TC2 or TC3 out there in that site. Um, if there'd been prior testing, um, you know, or nearby testing, then we may be able to get to that more practically. Just the uh, last question. This is probably a more procedural question. Um, in option three, it says we have to adopt the report. Do we have to adopt the report? <laughs> Can we just adopt the solution? Maybe wording adopt the proposed policy approach change, essentially. Thank you, Blair. So we have um, recommendations three point three, three point four, three point five. 
and 3.6. Do I have a mover for Councillor Tukapua? Yeah, I'll move it with a, just a minor amendment. So in the 3.5 to Jonathan's point, receive um, the appendix or the Tonkin and Taylor and adopt the policy approach. And then furthermore, three and oh, do you want to leave three point six? Sorry, yeah, I just so clarify what you're asking. The attachment of the, the appendix is instead of adopt, and then oh, right. adopt the policy approach. So, so, so that's this is just word change. So. Right. Okay. So we're receiving the Horfuna District yeah. on factional A and yeah. adopt the policy approach and, and adopt the yeah. so. Okay. Yeah, is, everyone, that. is everyone following that amendment? Okay. So, Councillor Tukapua is moving 3.5 with those change of wordings in 3.6. Seconded by Councillor Proctor. Any further discussion or debate on it? Put the motion. All those in favour? All right. Against? Carried. Thank you. I'm just acknowledging Mr. Bolton's attendance in the chambers at the moment. Thank you, Peter, for your interest in this matter. I'm sure you'll... Uh, yeah, good to see you. Thank you. All right, so we now move to 8.1 on page 141. Uh, we're looking at the Interim Organisation Performance Report. Can I move 2.1, 2.2? Uh, that have been received and recognised not significant. Thank you, Councillor Proctor, for seconding any... Um, oh, Chief Executive, would you like to make any comments about this report? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm happy to take the report as read, uh, but officers are prepared to answer any questions you may have, noting that this is the interim um, OPR, so reminding Council that every second month, every second meeting we have the full OPR, this is just the interim. Can I just ask a question then? On, on the bottom of page 148, it talks about delivering on the Livid Town Centre transformation strategy. And the last sentence says, discussions have also taken place with HKRFU around the Livid domain and awaiting a response from Age Concern Horofana. I just wondered what response we were waiting from them for. I'm not sure if you wish it, but we can follow up and let you know. Thank you. Any further questions? <laughs> Council Board. Uh, can I query the um, change of energy provider? Great to see that we're using less energy, um, but we're using... 30% more gas, is that what I'm saying there? Well, well, you know, averaged across time of use and non-time of use, between 24% more gas than we expected to. That's what that data says, that it's gas time of use tracking 17% higher than projected um, versus the non-time of use is tracking 29% less than projected, and so we can get Nikki, yeah. So that, so I think it's to do with the categorisation of how the gas is charged, whether it's use tracking or non-time of use tracking. But we can get um, Nikki Brady to follow up with a more comprehensive answer to you. It balances itself out. Is the advice I'm getting. Good to note that yeah, we're using less electricity overall though. Councillor Jennings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick question about uh, O2NL is one of the top 10 priorities. So we obviously have these um, monthly uh, catch-ups with um, NZTA um, personnel and we talk about various things. Um, and I was just wondering, are we on track in terms of um, 
what we're expecting to see in terms of the um, PDA and other agreements and, and various things that we're that are in progress with NZTA. Is everything on track? Yeah, it's obviously very early phases of um, development for the alliance. So Wakate key focus at the moment um, to get their alliance projects up and running. Uh, we're also currently working through a process around council resourcing. So that's um, that's a work in progress, and I, I suppose you could say that's on track. Um, that will then cascade down into a number of the other matters. Um, yeah, but clearly. The key focus at the moment is to align programs. It's a project that's going to run over the next six years. Um, some of those pieces will need to fit into it. Um, you know, there's outstanding questions around revocation and the like that have been raised, but it's important we focus our energy on uh, program and process to input and ensure that uh, both council officers and elected members uh, integrate into their O2L program. So yeah, there's multiple work streams, and we're just in the process of internally standing up a um, communications uh, network that will need to obviously loop elected members into that process as well. So, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Right. Um, so, no further questions. Move uh, 2.3 that having considerable matters raised in the interim organisation performance report, 20th of March 2024, the report be noted. We'll move, seconded by Councillor Grimstone. All those in favour? Against Kerry. Thank you. Moving now to 8.2, the long term plan 2021 2041 monitoring report. Uh, move 2.1, 2.2, the report be received. Uh, seconded by Councillor Grimstone. All those in favour? Against carried. Are there any questions or queries from elected members in regard to this report? Just while you're preparing your questions, can, can I just acknowledge, Council, that the um, the updates um, associated with this monitoring report and the next monitoring report aren't at the level that um, I think all of us expect of ourselves. Um, it's just a reflection of the capacity pressures on the business at the moment around long-term plans. So I just wanted to acknowledge you might be reading some things or you're like, isn't that the same update we got last month? Um, the intent will be to not this week, but next week, um, do some work across the business to just get an out-of-cycle update um, where we lock some people in a room and get some get some updates that mean this does look different next time. I don't know whether locking people in a room is the appropriate term that we should be using, but anyway, um, <laughs> we It's either that or press-ups, so... <laughs> Thanks, very good. Um, rumors. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, are there any questions about this report? Noting the comments uh, made, Council Proctor. Can't wait to go to the toilet on the other row. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so now moving to. Um, 8.3, which is Council Resolution Actions Monitoring Report for March 2024. Uh, can I move 2.1, 2.2 that the report be received? Um, seconded by Council Proctor, thank you. All those in favour? Against Kerry. Again, are there any questions or clarifications sought in this report? Thank you. Moving on to 9.1, the proceedings of the Risk and Assurance Committee meeting the 21st of February 2024. Uh, can I move 2.1 that um, the proceedings be received and 2.2 that the minutes uh, held, that the, we received the minutes of that meeting. Uh, seconded by Councillor Grimstone. Thank you. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Councillor Timmy Hunt, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to note that I was present in that meeting, but I'm not in the minutes. Was all. Right. So, the members of... So, you were in attendance? Yes. Okay, thank you. Acknowledging that change. Right, 
no further clarification sought. Move to the exclusion of the public. I think that brings us to the end of our open agenda. Um, since we've dealt with the, the Hoxton Community Board minutes, can I then move um, the exclusion of the public uh, for the following parts of the proceedings of this meeting in regard to C1, the Levin Town Centre Transformation, C2, Oxford Street Plain Trees, C3, Council Resolution and Actions Monitoring Report, and C4, the proceedings of the Chief Executive Employment and Performance Committee from the 14th of February 2024. Uh, seconded by uh, Councillor Young. All those in favour? Against carry. Thank you very much. Um, can I just 